Yes, yes. Apparently, we are back together. Uh, I was happy to see all seven students here today. Very impressive that they decided they wanted to uh, be subjected to some more learning. Uh, Dr. Mudit, you shared some of the handouts with them, so now they are experts in the field as well. So I'm glad to uh, glad that that has happened. I will. Uh, I've spoken to some of you individually, but I will let you know that uh, I had the chance to do some traveling on the weekend and see more of this beautiful state of Punjab. Uh, I went to where did I go? Amritsar, Amritsar. Yes. Golden, Temple. Golden Temple. Golden Temple. Golden Temple. And I had a lovely Terrible. head covering. And as, just as I was about to go in, my colleague here noticed I was chewing gum. Hmm. He said, chewing gum, chewing gum. And I was like, what? Hmm. Chewing gum. Oh, okay. So I almost uh, created a great cultural crisis, but it was avoided. Uh, it was a beautiful day. It was not, it had rained, yeah. so it was not hot. So did you go to border, Indo-Pakistan border? See that? You're always ahead of the game. Just wait. Okay. <laughs> so we walked around the temple and we saw the shrines. We went into the water. We had a chance to have the... Salad, yeah. Yes. Very good. Greasy. It is my, on, hands, it is my hands were so beautiful and soft it afterwards. Is, it is made in clarified butter. That's why. Desi ghee. Ah, from ghee. So I should have put some in my hair yeah. and on my face and everything. Like that. But it was good. So the next time I had it, I was ready for it. I was like, yeah. I slopped it in my hand and I ate it right away and just rubbed my hands. And so it was very nice. But it was a fascinating place to go. And I was very honored to be taken there. And I understand the cultural and the religious significance of that location. Uh, and it was just... Um, we don't have things like that in Canada. We don't have great temples. We have some churches, but a lot of our buildings are not grand and they are not useful. They have to have a cover over them because they get snow and ice and rain, whereas a building like that is meant to, to be open to the outside. And so it was really uh, amazing to see. And it also made me think about learning and i'm always reflecting on what we we're doing here and the, those opportunities to learn from uh our elders our experts and to be in a place that that uh, fosters that kind of learning so that was really amazing um i bought some souvenirs i didn't get pickpocketed so that was good it was like put your money in your pocket and put your hands in your pocket so uh and then we went to yes Yes. Hmm. That's where the retreating ceremony is, right? No, no, no. Yeah. There's other one. Oh, yeah. Yes. And then and then we went and saw that that park and, and they learned a bit about that story as well. Um, horrible um, story. Saw the well and things hmm. that are a part of that event. Uh, it was, yeah, it was not good, but important to reflect on those events in our history and our shared uh, life as human beings and Good things we have done, bad things we have done, and to learn from them. Then I went to uh, we went to the sister university there, the uh, grad program, and met Doctor H K Verma, principal. Yes, Doctor Verma. Yes, very interesting man. Mm. He made me a sandwich. We had a sandwich in his office, and we talked about programming. And then I had a chance to tour the building, and uh, he told me about the work that he had done here director of extension for many years and i mentioned the people that i was working with and yeah really uh interesting place out in a very old university and talked about how long that location has been there and and uh, what he is trying to do with his program and you know we talked a lot about oops uh, this document, right? <laughs> the same, the same frustrations that some of you have, and the same beauty that is in this document, uh, and how they have all of those same facilities as a private institution that delivers the Gadvasu program. There, very uh, lots of good things that he is trying to do in the future with with his work there. And then we went to the retreating ceremony, and it was very interesting. We felt like being at a 
uh, rock concert <laughs> and maybe a soccer match or a cricket match. And the guy was getting the crowd excited and the music was loud. And the, the pageantry on both sides, the political theater, if I may use that, was mm. really amazing and a uh, very small crowd on the Pakistan side, huge crowd on the Indian side, rock concert, symphony on the other side and entertainment and people in the, on the ground dancing and they were playing club music and it was really, and then you would look at the other side and there was one guy who was, have you, if you've been there before, mm -hmm. he, he only has one leg and he just spins in circles on his one leg on the, 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 the yeah. Pakistan. Yes. Yes. And he has a, looks like he turns into an umbrella because he has a, his dress flares out and it was, yeah, it was really interesting. And I felt very safe. Apparently on Saturday, it might not have been as good of a day to be there, but uh, yeah, back on, on Saturday here. And then yesterday we went to Chandigarh. Chandigarh? Chandigarh. Chandigarh. Yes. Okay. I even have it written down here, but I'm trying to say it. Chandi. Went to the rock garden. And I could have spent all day there. So everybody has everyone been there before yeah. to see that? Students? The Is guy who there? made the rock garden, he made it out of crap. Yeah. Hmm. It was, well, and, and, and he makes beauty out of it. Recycled material. And I went and he with my colleague. Cycle, bicycle. Yeah. He, once the governor asked him, he wanted to honor him with the governor of state. He, he said, I can send you a car. No, I'll come on cycle. Oh my gosh. And he was an inspector in that municipal really? corporation. Oh, wow. Anyway, it took so many, way too many pictures. Every time we wanted to go, <clears throat> Gersha was waiting for me. And I'm like, just one more picture. And then I said, I will promise I won't take any more pictures. And then we would go around the corner. And I would be like, oh, I have to take a picture of this. So it's amazing. Those places, seeing things differently, seeing them through the eyes of, of other people, it's just so fascinating. And, and you know, your vision gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and uh, I was just really thrilled. I have not, I've not been to a part of Punjab yet. Although we weren't in Punjab, we had crossed the border. Uh, which I learned as well. The capital city is actually not in the capital and it is just shared. So that was really interesting. But every time I've, I've been somewhere, it has just uh, been fascinating and so different than my experience and really helping me think about things, everything that I do differently. Is if you really want to broaden your sphere yeah. of knowledge, you stay over the weekend to see the the farmer's fair. Yeah, uh, yeah so that's yeah, a cultural that, experience. That, yeah. Really <laughs> you don't know, like, too yes. much. <laughs> too much? Yeah. Well, I'm not too worried. Uh, and I and I hope you, that you all had some downtime and had the opportunity to, you know, celebrate things that are going on, think about big events that are going on, but also take some time for your yourselves because it is so very important the work that you are doing. Students, you were probably just doing schoolwork all weekend, right? No? <laughs> You were out at having a good time with your friends, eating a lot. Okay, what were you eating? Pizza? What? No? Mess? Mess food. What's mess? Oh, oh, you were eating mess food. Oh, okay. So you were eating roti and rice and curd and spicy potatoes and spicy peas. And what's that cheese Lentils. stuff? Lentils. What's the cheese stuff? The like paneer, paneer. tofu. Paneer, yes, cheese. Paneer. Yeah. Tofu also and paneer. Yeah. And parantas. Yes. Paneer is something like lots that. of parantas. <laughs> no. Lots of lots of Coca Cola <laughs> to wake you up to do schoolwork. No. Okay. Well, let's get started. Uh, today is again a very practical day in a lot of ways, where we're going to be talking about specific teaching strategies. Uh, and it is, again, something we have maybe expected to be sooner in our learning experience, but we're waiting till we have created a really sound founda foundation in what you know and what you um, think you know in terms of your teaching. And it is where people who are new to teaching often start. They just think about what am I actually doing in a classroom or a lab or my learning environment. That's really all they're worried about. And then they start to pile up 
oh, wait, what about learning outcomes? Oh, wait, what about assessment? But we've already done a great job of going through those. And now we're at the part where I said most people think they start, but it's actually after we have set up so many other things. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Or I can do that. Yes. Okay. Every time I do that. So this is what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be hopefully opening up your eyes and giving you some opportunity to think about what you do in your teaching environment differently. And I've got some handouts that we'll go through and talk about our own experiences. But the idea is we can't make change unless we know what the options are. So today we'll present some options, uh, even just things to think about. So when you're on your bicycle or your walk or wherever you can ruminate, not like a cow would ruminate, but ruminate in your own minds about, you know, why might I use this? How might this apply to what I'm doing in a particular situation? Uh, we want to review the characteristics of some of the major strategies that maybe you're using already. And that's great. That might reinforce some of your existing practice, or it might have you go, wait a minute, that's really not what my intention is in the classroom. I might try to, to do something differently. Um, thinking about what you're doing in terms of your specific discipline. So many of you are doing theoretical, but many of you are also doing clinical and practical. Is there something that you could be applying that is different, specific to what you're doing? And those are the instances where in these types of gatherings, you are, you are looking at what does it mean to me and my students, as opposed to the program or the university. It's a chance to be a little bit focused uh, and a little bit selfish in a good way in terms of, of understanding what you're, what you're doing in your classwork. And then we're going to end up with a look at lecturing, because the bottom line is in university culture, lectures will still be around. They'll always be around. It's a part of what has to happen just for, you know, the 95 and the 105 size classrooms and those types of things. There is a, an economy of scale that is built into lecturing. So if we're going to do it, how do we do it well? How do we make it so that students want to come to our lectures as opposed to, oh, I have to go to Jay's class and he's just going to talk and talk and talk forever. Um, we want them to be like, oh, I want the, I want to go to Dr. Barty's class because she is going to be so exciting at her lecture and I'm really excited about it and can't wait. I'm going to go early and get a seat in the front row. That's what we're going to talk about to kind of wrap up our day or the, the morning session in terms of lecturing. Does that sound good? Yes. <laughs> Nod, smile. Well, Students? Thumbs up? All right. And we'll keep going. Let, did you notice that he did his right hand and he did his left hand? Yes. Sorry, I noticed silly things like that. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, I've asked you this uh, at other sessions, but again, I want you to take a minute and just think about your favorite teacher, and again, why? And maybe it's the same teacher as before, or maybe it's someone else just based on some of the discussions we've had. So I'll be quiet for another 50 seconds. Okay. <laughs> And students, I may be asking you to participate just in case you think you're not going to do this. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one, and time. All right. My favorite teacher, one of my favorite teachers, was my high school history teacher. And he was English. And during World War II, he was a fighter pilot. Oh, good. So he was stationed in Malta, which is an island in the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. and was involved in battles in the Mediterranean and Sicily and places like that. And he was a very short, very round Englishman, and I could never figure out how he would ever fit in the cockpit of a fighter plane because he was big. 
but he had the ability to captivate us by telling stories mm. uh, and he was teaching history primarily through lecture, primarily through being at the front of the classroom and talking about mostly dead old people, because that's what history is a lot of times in high school. Mm. But we were fascinated. We would come early and we would ask questions and we'd be involved because of the way that he approached his study. And that's a person that when I think about the teaching I've had, I've had many mentors, but that was the first person that really got me excited about teaching other than the subject material that I might have been interested in. It was that particular individual. His name is Mr. Al Cox, C-O-X was his name. Any other, any stories like that that people would like to share about favorite teachers? There, put the word share up, so you know what we're gonna share. So like, uh, sir, when I took admission in the veterinary, veterinary field, in the Bachelor of Veterinary Science, first year, there used to be a very dry subjects, like uh, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry. And uh, we were not fortunate enough that uh, there were old, um, he's retired, now they have retired. He has retired and not me, teacher. I don't, yes, I don't want to name him. Right. But uh, the way of teaching was not good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I started thinking that where will this teaching will continue forever like that. <laughs> uh, and then we, when we came to the second year, then there was a pharmacology teacher, Dr. Shrivastava. He changed my vision. Mm. Excellent teacher with a very good command on the subject. And the way of teaching was very simple. Whatever he has taught, I still remember. Yeah. So that pharmacology, I think um, uh, Dr. Sani might be having a better uh, connection and I'll say I can better, he has spent more time with him. But during that time, very gentle. And right now he's vice chancellor uh, in Mathura Veterinary University. Wow. Yes. Huh. And uh, I, I, I think I'm fortunate that uh, uh, my even my uh, roommate, he was like, he was advisory to that uh, Dr. Shrivastu and I used to go with him as well. And I, I really enjoyed his company. Huh. Wow. Yeah. I can see that by the look on your face. <laughs> you, you just have joy coming off you today. And what a nice change from what you thought from your first year. Yeah. You probably thought, oh my, this is going to be a very long, painful experience yeah. and to have that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Other yeah, for thoughts? Me, if you ask, uh, it was my English teacher, particularly mm. in 10th and 12th. Mm. He, was, he is Dr. P. Varadrajan. P. Varadrajan. Mm -hmm. So actually, English is always a very good subject, though I am not from English background completely, so I failed to understand many of the things initially. Mm. Now also. But he instilled a confidence in me that you can write a bit in English. And I am really thankful to that person. Sometimes I think that whenever he used to talk me, like his team talk, he was tired of talking about the Indian history because that was must be his course in MA. He was talking about Winston Churchill. Oh. <laughs> Winston Churchill was Prime Minister when India was getting independence. Is before that, just before Clement Attlee, mm -hmm. he was the Prime Minister of UK. So he was talking about Gandhiji and he was talking about Mr. Winston Churchill. And the way we were not knowing at 10th standard, I was not having that vision of how these things have happened. And but I still remember and I could still correlate some of the things whatever he has taught. And the third thing which he told me was to me that you are my bullet. You are my bullet. Mm -hmm. Wherever you will reach, I'll be <laughs> always recognized. <laughs> wow. And I still feel that I am his bullet. Yeah. Wherever I hit, he's always there. Wow. Huh. That's fascinating. 
so passionate about his subject, but also yes. passionate about you as an individual. Not me. Yeah. I took that thing. He took in the he told in the class. Yeah. Lots of bones. Thank you. I get it. Thank you for sharing. You got tracer bullet. Oh, you can see that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Just sending you. Yeah, sharing. I was in my high school junior. I'm in in class ten mm -hmm. in India. So I had a geography teacher, Dr. R. K. Mr. R. K. Sharma. He's no more now, but he taught geography beautifully. And he it was such a, you know, doing all those contours on the maps, it's not easy to understand. Mm -hmm. So he made us understand in such a beautiful manner that I still remember what contours are and what things grow in different parts. I'm very good in geography, actually. Mm -hmm. So thanks to that man. He taught in a very interesting manner. Mm -hmm. So orthography. Geography. Yeah, but is orthography is also part of geography in terms of map reading and uh, right? Isn't that... uh, we don't have no that okay. much in Indian <laughs> syllabus. I was in ICSC, yeah. oh, okay, Indian certificate of not CBSE. Yeah. So we didn't have that thing, mm -hmm. but we did have a study of continents and history was uh, this geography was quite you know difficult subject, mm -hmm. but he made it look so easy and nice and that the concepts are still clear today. And geography is a big thing. I mean, you know, you should know where you are at present, mm -hmm. which part of the world, longitude, latitude. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it broadens your horizon. And all of these, and thank you, all of these experiences may seem like they're in courses that don't matter mm. to the casual observer. It's mm. like, oh, that was something you had to take, whatever. But if you if you listen to the people who have shared, the impact in those courses have resonated and have broadened and have the bullet has hit many, many times mm -hmm. in the work that you are doing. And that's, again, a, a significant concept for us to master as instructors is that it doesn't matter what we are teaching at what level. We have the ability to have the impact, much like these wonderful stories we've heard today, that will continue and to inspire and to make people Oh, feel good about the success that they have. Other other stories that people wish to share, like to share. I have shared it. You have shared. Yeah. Okay. okay, sir. So yeah. my favorite teacher is one of my co-advisor during my postgraduate studies, Dr. Shilendra Upadhyay. Mm -hmm. So basically, it was like that when I took admission in medicine for my PG in Spas Jammu. So there I get uh, embedded in between two professors. One was head and who was head and one my advisor. So they were having cross heads, oh. both of them. Oh, sure. <laughs> so uh, my advisor gave me, uh, wanted me to work on equine trypanosomosis, whereas the head was against it because he himself had did, done that research and he didn't want it to be again continu continued. So... It was a certain logger head between both of those, those and I was just in between seeing what I have to do. Oh my gosh. And then one of the, he was a, he was a very young faculty member at that time. He was a student professor in fact. So he guided me through and uh, in fact, he, I was like that. I will leave this degree. I will not do hmm. at that time. Wow. So he motivated me and uh, then I continued to my whole degree. I did my research without even informing my advisor that what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> my advisor didn't know I gave the synopsis seminar. And then after that, he didn't know that what I was doing. Hmm. And actually I completed all my thesis. And you know, my thesis was just 59 pages. So hmm. much neatly compiled. Hmm. And within two months, I got three major publications from those that those thesis. Out of 59 pages. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, impressive. and uh, uh, my advisor didn't knew that uh, what I did. I just get, completed whole thesis and I just put it in, in front of him. Sir, please check it. If you find any mistake, then tell me. And there was no such a major mistake that he could find out. And did he check? Yeah, he checked. Okay. He checked, but he could not <laughs> find because he was not having any idea. The mistakes he got was is are that like that. Uh, grammar, it, grammar. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was important thing, sir, because during that my PG, uh, I gave my credit seminar on renal failure. And we see, I gave my credit seminar on renal failure. 
when i as there was a politics in department so everyone other teacher they wanted to pull my legs okay so when i gave that seminar it uh, i was very good at presenting so what happened that uh, all the teachers started uh, pulling my legs and that teacher upadhyay dr upadhyay i was telling you he just stood up there and he told them that you take in writing from me that in future he will be your teacher oh wow <laughs> and you know i did my mvsc in equines my phd in ruminants and then i was for two and a half years i was in extension in uh, kvk and from after that at the end i am again here with renal failure yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay it's okay it's okay with renal failure okay and my first student uh, i should i had my first student just passed out uh, last month uh -huh. and for his uh, his is evaluation dr padhay gave hmm. <laughs> Wow. Jay, like actually, uh, I should not say that uh, I've got a favorite teacher. There are many teachers who are good. Like, yes. I named Dr. Atke Sharma, but there was Dr. Mr. Dr. K. L. Toki, and uh, he was also very good. And then I got my father operated for cataract. The, he was not my teacher even, yeah. but he was a doctor in Jalandhar, very good doctor. He taught me many things about ophthalmology. and So... Actually, we should not say favorites. Yes. There can be many. Yes, mm -hmm. and I and that's why I know sometimes it's difficult to narrow it down. Yeah. But the but the story you told, and thank you for sharing that, is it's, it's not easy being the student. And yeah. sometimes that one person can come in and and almost rescue you from a very difficult situation. And look at the success that you have had, because someone was kind enough to come in and help you find a way but also give you the confidence that you could do your your work without supervision essentially and to have something that ultimately if it's if you're getting three three peer-reviewed publications out of it that's the that's the ultimate judge of of the success of your work right are the the peers the people who are in in the industry not faculty members who are trying to feel better about themselves and undermine their students and diminish them we want to build up. We don't want to tear down. And that's a great build up story. And, and again, like you said, it's come full circle. Um, and and I, and what's kind of funny is when you say, I have renal failure now. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> but I know what you mean. You're working on renal failure. It's not that you do. Um, but but that's, that's where we also have a bit of a responsibility as faculty members to look out for all students. Sometimes we, we have the care and attention of those students who are directly under our supervision, but we also have a responsibility to that broader, uh, you know, the, the profession of teaching and the care and, and feeding of students. And you're right, it's hard to, to say we have one, because I, I also could go through and name about 10, but I wanted to, to, to share an example. And, and those are all, uh, all that you have shared have been really good. I want to ask the students now, is there, is there a, Someone who's had an impact on you that you wanted, would like to talk about even a little bit? And, and don't worry, Dr. Pathak isn't here, so you don't have to say that he gives good the highest marks or anything like that. So, yeah. Is there, is there someone or a teacher, maybe even before you came to university, that helped you? Someone's pet bird is trying to get in. Yeah. Anyone? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murdy, for eyeballing them. Uh, so, my favorite teacher was, uh, her name was Ms. Uh, Rupinder. Uh, uh, so, I like all the teachers, but uh, she was my personal favorite. Uh, during my schooling, uh, when I was uh, in my 10th standard, she was my chemistry teacher. Uh, at that time, uh, I am unable to uh, follow the equations. As we all know that uh, chemistry is full of equations. Mm. Uh, her way of teaching is very good. And uh, uh, she is the one uh, I am able to uh, uh, understand these equations. Uh, that's why she, uh, she was my person. So she took the time. She realized that you needed some support. Very hard working too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's for sure. 
Any other good stories, students? Yeah, please. Thank you. So I I was in a ninth or tenth or in a villages the tenth class is old class is very important. So in ninth class I was can got into bad company. So I was not studying well. Though I was present in our classes, but uh, there was teacher. So she supported me. So she believes in me. So. Uh, when a teacher believes in you, so you got a feeling you have to not to disappoint. So I got out of the bad company. I got good grades. Uh, at the end, and here you are today. Happy ending. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> With you. Excellent. Uh, yeah, he was very good. Actually, if somebody can take you on a right track, he is a really good teacher. Yeah. Sir, my favorite teacher is a surgery teacher, Mahindra sir. Mm. So he's very funny and his way of teaching is very nice. Uh, I was having problem in interpretation of ultrasound and X rays. Now I understand it fully. Oh, good for Yeah. And I can see by the smile on your face, although you usually have a smile on your face when you're here. So wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And you'll notice that that the stories take place at different times in people's lives. Some sometimes they are in uh, in high school, what I would call high school. Sometimes they are in uh, getting started in your uh, vet program. Sometimes it's when you are a graduate student or are moving through your program. So there's all of these opportunities of belief, right? When when someone believes in you that you can be successful, that makes all the difference in the world. Any other? Students wish to share? That's pretty good. That's three. Oh, honey. <laughs> uh, I will say that what many of you are talking about is what we see on the surface as people who are learners or engaged in learning activity. And it is, it's often very easy to see that our teachers are caring individuals based on the way that they are interacting with us. Uh, they take the time. They are effective in the way that when we come to their classes, <laughs> that we feel that we are learning something and we're moving forward. And uh, did you need water? Honey? No, no, no. My child? No, okay. There you go. But a lot of the time, that natural ability needs uh, a system or a framework to be effective. Much like we have many people in our lives who are supportive of us and are helpful and caring. And when we need that little boost or that confidence, they are the ones to provide it and it allows us to be successful in our lives. When we're in the teaching profession, we often have people, and I notice by who is in the room, the kind, caring people that are here, that we go beyond that, and we need some kind of structure to be able to be successful. And that's why, let's see if this is working. We have to start identifying the role that good teaching strategies have in that. So all of the stories that people told were based on successful individuals. But I'll go back, Dr. Run, to your story about that person who knew, you said they knew their content and they were able to do something with their content because they also were effective teachers. So they were a good person, they knew their content, but that last piece of it that made them even more successful was the ability to not just put it in front of you, but put it in front of you in a way that was effective and made you as passionate as they were about the subject or to realize that that we can go places we can learn we can be the bullet that's another so we have crispy and the bullet so those are two of the things i'll take away what when i use the term teaching strategy what comes to your mind so if i say this is a teaching strategy that is a teaching strategy what, as a general term what do people think of What is the need of the student? 
Okay. And uh, what is the course curriculum? That thing I have to cover that also. Okay. But among that uh, syllabus, what is the most important thing which I should stress upon the student should not miss in the end? Okay. And uh, then every student is different. Everybody is different. Everybody's needs are different. So you should also keep into mind that thing also and teach from that angle. Okay. So you're so close. So I've done such a good job of making you think about all the external factors. Mm -hmm. What is that internal, when I say teaching strategy, what is that internal piece that all of those things are influencing? You're so close. But not close enough. No, well, no. <laughs> but I appreciate you are getting us. You are, we're on the edge of the cliff. I need someone, I need mm -hmm. someone to push us off. When we talk about a teaching strategy, maybe an example. Do you have an example of a teaching strategy? That's all right. I come from a college of education. This is all we talk about. So the teaching strategy is the process. So all of those things that you said were great, but what is the process that allows us to do that? And when, when I started today, I talked about lecturing, for example. So to give a lecture that, that is connected to the outcomes and is matching what the students' needs are and their specific uh, learning goals is a way that process unfolds. So if I say, this is what they have to learn, and at the halfway through, they're gonna write a paper, but the activity that I do to take them through that content is the teaching strategy. And if I go to the next slide, oh, oh that's why you have a, this piece of paper here, because that is, unless some of you, I don't know, is anyone here a hawk where you can read that? No, or a raptor of some kind where you can read it? Okay. Here's an example of a hundred different teaching strategies that we could possibly use in post-secondary, so at university. And, and you may look at those and go, oh my gosh, Jay, this is the biggest, most complex list I've ever seen in my life. And you may look at number one and number two and number three and go, yeah, those are the ones that I like. You keep your other 97. <laughs> I don't need them. But these are all different ways that we can make the process and getting to those learning outcomes and getting to assessment more interesting. And it is a bit intimidating. So I don't want you to think, oh my gosh, somehow... I have to find a way to use all of these because that will never be the case. But there are all kinds of different ways that we can make our courses more engaging and interesting and build around your content and process knowledge that you already have. And when I talked about going for a walk or a bike ride and thinking, some of these you may want to learn more about and you may think about that. So in my class, for example, someone shout out one that you're curious about on this list. So the last one, the hundred, number hundred, real world real applications. applications. All right. I love that. Yes. Because that is, you know, uh, you can go backward from that and you can tailor your teaching according to the real world needs. Perfect. Clinical needs. Yes. Th that inspires the students. Because the syllabus is so huge, you could get lost in that. Of course, you have to teach everything, mm -hmm. but don't forget. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and in this particular discipline, your life is all about the real world. Mm -hmm. So if you are just lecturing, if you're just lecturing all the time and talking, it's really hard to get students into the real world. Mm -hmm. And I think Dr. Rajneesh was talking about doing screening for farmers, for example. So the students at the fair next week mm -hmm. will actually be screening farmers giving tests, how much more real world could that be? Yeah. You can't, you can't beat that. So what a great opportunity to expose them to those concepts and those ideas to do some of the co-curricular work, you know, that may not be in the learning outcomes, but if you can't talk to farmers, 
or ranchers or producers, you're not going to be a very successful veterinarian. Am I correct? Is that a safe bet to make? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that is indeed why that would be an important learning strat or teaching strategy. Uh, number 24 is one that I have done in this group. Is anyone, have you, have you heard of think, pair, share previously, or do you do that? Yeah. Dr. Susmita, have you done think, pair, share? Yeah. Okay. So the idea of what I have done is I've given you a question and then I said, talk to your elbow partner yes. <clears throat> and then share with the group. Really simple way of getting some discussion going on in the classroom that doesn't involve any kind of technology, that doesn't involve any kind of extra planning. At some point in time, you can just drop that out of the sky and it can happen in your clinical environment as well. So if you're looking at a cadaver, for example, or if you're looking at a particular um genetic mutation that's hopping around in front of you, then, then have the students talk to each other. I saw it this way. Oh, really? I saw it this way. I'd never thought of it that way. The same way we have been successful. And that's one that you don't necessarily plan for, but you've always got it in your back pocket. In case of emergency, you throw it out and you say, okay, talk to your partner about it. What's going on? And it also allows you to go around and listen in on the groups and see what they're doing. I will do a think, pair, share, where I will do a think, a pair, pair with another pair. So you've got four people, talk about it in four, and then four more, and then we talk in a larger group. So you can modify it. Again, that's a process. Morning, Dr. Rajneesh. Hi. Happy Monday. <laughs> Sorry for that's all right. We're just writing the final exam. I hope you have a pen. Can you give him a copy of the final exam? Uh, and I hope you studied all weekend. Otherwise, I can, no. I, I can send you my voice. Yes. <laughs> uh, are there any others on this list that seem interesting to you or maybe that you have done previously? And very important is 86 goal setting. I've not jumped on everything, but whatever my okay. yeah, goal setting. Demonstrations. Demonstrations. Okay. So goal setting. Goal setting by the students. So you can say, what do you want to learn in this particular lesson before we get started? And goal setting by you. I think that's good. Yeah. Demonstrations. Do you want to in practical? Do you want to talk more about that? Like in practicals. Okay. Classes we demonstrate right the legions grossly. We show them the parasite microscopically and then discuss with them the practical implications of the disease. Beautiful. Yeah. So a demonstration is, again, another teaching strategy or process. Pyramid of learning, you know, yeah. if you just hear, you forget after some time. But if you lecture, you remember like, more. Mm -hmm. But if you do, hands-on, you remember the most. Yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. And, and why is a, I'm going to go back to you on this one, and I agree with what you say. Why is a demonstration better than just having the students work independently in the lab? giving them a set of instructions to follow. Why do you need to demonstrate? Actually, in undergraduate students, as I told you in the first, yeah. that uh, undergraduation means, in my opinion, some grinding and polishing mm -hmm. of skills. Mm -hmm. Postgraduate, they have the first-hand experience. Yeah. Like, if somebody will show me that this is a parasite, then when I will take that subject in future, then I know because people say that this, the eye sees only which the brains know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is in your brain, you can see if I know that, okay, this is a Babesia, it look like this one, pyriform or ring-like, then whenever I will be presented with a case in the clinics, I will be able to see it. Fabulous. After practice. So you are... Demonstration is required. So the same way that we have goal setting can be for students or our instructors, demonstration can be you demonstrate. Yeah. And then they so show them proper technique, mm -hmm. for example, and then they demonstrate back. Yeah, like simple yes. staining of a blood slide. Yeah. We demonstrate them in the third year. Then it's up to them when they are in the veterinary clinical practice course. They want to make slide. They stain them. They see them in our clinical diagnostic laboratory. Mm -hmm. Some of them will be posted in polyclinics where there are facilities of microscopy. And just last week, a phone call came, sir, this is the slide I want to make. You tell mm. me how to make. And unfortunately, he was a student of parasitology. 
must have known these things. So one simple mistake he was making. So I just asked him, he said, yes, this is the one which I am making. He corrected it and got excellent results. But when you're doing demonstrations, and I love that story, and that shows me that you're a great teacher because you care enough to help him. At PG level, yes. not at UG level. Yes. Well, you still care at all levels, right? <laughs> but there's where you can start to do formative assessment. So with a demonstration, show me what you're doing. Okay, you're not quite there. I want you to do this, follow these steps. Show me again. Still not quite there. We can go through and it takes time, but it's when you choose a teaching strategy that fits with the skill that you want to develop. So that says 46 number, problem solving, I would say. What he said. Could be. 46. Could be. Yeah. These are not as a veterinarian, the exclusive. is also important. Yeah. Even 66, you know, case <laughs> studies, case study, very important professional. Vets. All and drugs are there, but they cannot be applied in one group. Yeah. So show me the person, I will show you the rule. According to that, show me the teacher, I will show you the strategy. Everybody is different. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that's what we want to see. The As I was mentioning, these are not mutually exclusive and some you will combine together. So yes, you need to have critical thinking in most of what you're doing. So you cannot just pull it out and say, today we will critically think, tomorrow we will not critically think. It's a strategy that you will use throughout and you'll probably use many of these in connection. So real world demonstrations that involve critical thinking. So you can pile them up on top of each other. The, the key part of, of this, not to scare you because there's a lot on here, but just to let you know, first of all, Maybe you're doing a lot of these already and weren't sure what you might call it and that you have options. So if you find that the students are saying, I just don't you know, understand, or maybe you think you can go deeper. Maybe you have a really good approach now, but you want to move them 10% better. Is there something on here? Um, response journals, number 61, for example, does that put the onus on them to write what we have done at the end of the day and then share it with me. And I can go, okay, this is giving me more information in terms of my teaching and what's going on. And they can, they can provide me with the individual perspective, but much like when we collect data, I'm thinking of you and collecting data, uh, we can look for themes. So when we have that reflective feedback or that journaling, we could say, oh, okay, 10 of the 20 students say this is something they'd like to learn more of or that they really enjoyed and maybe we will do more of it. So it's yeah. it's a way of, of being able to look at the processes in your classroom differently and to have some options. And again, we could, we could go through and talk about all 100 of these. I'm not going to do that today because it's kind of frightening. We're going to talk about five or six of them as we get through. But at any point in time, and we were talking about this last night, uh, when I leave, so I'm when I go back to Canada, if there's any of this stuff, any of this information you want to know more about or follow up, if it's curriculum mapping, it's these two. But if it's the teaching strategies and practice, reach out to me. I'll make sure that you all have my contact information. If we want to get together and, and do a chat. If we want to have this group come together and I can come in through video or whatever, and we want to we want to know more about these, then absolutely. Because there are, you know, the, the possibilities are limitless. And I know I just see how much enthusiasm there is in this group and the interest to be better. And, and that's something that I would like to to support if, if possible. Um, but this this is, you know, when we look at the list, if we're oh, OK, next Wednesday, I'm teaching a class. Uh, I'll just pick a number. OK, gamification. I guess that's number 77. That'll work. No. We, we don't just do it like that. And point of view, number 74 is very important. At an yes. Self-regulated learning, a skill that they may not have had a chance to do at any time in, in their high school, right? Yes. Yeah. Even 66 case studies. That is yeah. a clinical part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but don't think that you can only use it in one spot. Like mm -hmm. if you are good at using that, and we're going to, we will talk about case studies here. Uh, in a bit, then find a way to make it happen. The same way that your favorite professors are the ones that you talked about today, your favorite teachers did things differently. 
they didn't go through a manual, but they found something that resonated with who they were as a person and their material and what students found successful. And you may try some of these and fail miserably. And I have failed on 99 out of 100 of these and have come back to them and have tried to be better over the years. At some point in time, you just have to try it and see if it works. The worst thing that can happen is you have a bad lecture and then you may have to reteach something. And we do that anyway. We're constantly reteaching right? when we look at the formative nature of our, of our work. Yeah. Yes. Do you wish to add? You, uh, no? I'll give you the uh, floor. I think like uh, being a physician, I always uh, go for three. Yes. Case study analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is another uh, pro uh, uh, problem based learning mm. and 14th and 16th inquiry based learning. Mm -hmm. These, uh, I think, probably from the clinical department, I think these are the best. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And so you don't just go to the list and grab one, you think about this. And you understand how that applies to what's going on. And that's that, that teacher mentality. And on day one, when I asked you what kind of teacher training you had, and none of you have formal teacher training, right? Yeah. yeah. So what you are able to do, though, is articulate the same way as someone who has gone through a teaching program to say, this is the right fit. I believe the case studies inquiry-based PBL fit mm -hmm. because I've seen it. And, and again, that's a testament to the work that you have put in, the mistakes you've made, the learning that you've come from them, observing what your neighbors do, talking to people at other universities, but it, it should be that you can go to other resources and have that ability as opposed to just spending a lot of time and energy, which you have done to come up with, with the successful teaching strategies. And so I'm not here today to say change it all, but just look at some of the other ones. Doctor. Here, I, I would like to add something. For example, uh, uh, Dr. Saab, he, he has mentioned about the case studies. The, so uh, when you are in clinics, the thing is that you have to have knowledge about the clinical subjects, but you have to have knowledge about the paraclinical one. So I don't know how those case studies, they are related to, to those paraclinical subjects. So do the students go back and see if, or consult with the pathologist? Okay, they do so, actually. Okay. For example, he is uh, doing hands-on anesthesia. I'm teaching theory of the anesthesia. So that's a perfect. Yeah. So maybe fit. let me rephrase my question. So question is, when you prepare those case studies, does or do pathologist or microbiologist is involved in preparing that case studies or only it is you who is making that? Probably, uh, I think it's between the teacher and student. Student take the most of the work. Okay. Like they consult the pathologist, they consult the pharmacologist, or even sometimes biochemist as well. Yes. So probably we know almost uh, most, most of, of the things stuff. on what the student is going to perform, how they're going to, because like today only in the morning. So I was, uh, there was one case, no person was known to me and he brought the case. And uh, that case was having a history of weight loss and uh, there was uh, not eat, eating, drinking properly for last two to three days. Large. And when, two to three days. Large and small animal. In dog. In dog. And when I examined, I saw there was a lymphadenopathy and it was a generalized lymphadenopathy. Mm -hmm. And there were students who were there. Mm -hmm. So I taught, uh, taught them and I asked them that uh, how to approach in this case. So there can be a number of differentials. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that became a key study. So then I took a cytology out of the lymph node yeah. and then I went for the blood examination, serology, radiography, abdomen, and uh, then uh, thorax, radiography, and the student followed each and everything. And probably if they follow all the case till end, probably they will, they will find a very good case and they will remember for all of the life. This is the best way means how yes. yesterday is happened like happen in like 9.30 yes. in the morning when I went over there. And the case came and then I discussed. So this is how we, at least like I suppose that 25 to 30 case studies if a person perform in, in his uh, university period, mm -hmm. and probably that will be the best. Because hands-on study, this is a hands-on study. Yeah. You see, it's a great. You'll never forget. Yeah. You'll never forget. But if you do it yourself, yeah. follow the case.
Now, your question was, does it fit? Does that is that explanation? Yeah, here means the students they may go to the yeah, different the, teachers yeah, and they can contact those. Yeah, I, I took the pineal aspiration, I gave to the student and they will go to the pathologist Apologies. and they will stay in it themselves and then will follow. And the blood work, I told them, watch for uh, calcium. Mm. There must be hypercalcemia because I think it's a lymphoma. So they will learn from these things. Mm -hmm. Happens. Yeah. And and we'll get back to to case studies later, but what a great example of even the different way of using the term case study. Mm -hmm. Because in some places, the case study is a written document that you go through that, that takes people through. That's what we do for our yeah, post What is the difference yeah. between this, uh, that for our postgrad students? So uh, internship students. Yeah. Yeah. And Dr. J, what is yeah. the difference between three and 60? That is also case study, and I thought this is also case method, 66, same. I mentioned case study, but it was actually case method. I meant the same thing. Actually. So what is the difference three and 66? Very little. The name the and name. sometimes the way you approach it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And and method, yeah. Yeah. I think there are many which are overlapping. I think you ought to complete the yeah. century. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will go through each one of these and try them. Oh, 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 before okay. I come back, and I will, yeah. I will field test. Yes, a fish bowl discussion. Yes. Also oh, a fish bowl discussion yeah. is when, uh, kind of like what we're doing here, but we have someone in the middle, and everyone is kind of around them, okay. and then we ask them questions, and they have to be able to respond to a variety. So, if the idea of being in a fish bowl is everyone can look mm -hmm. inside the fish bowl. and the focus that is is there. Sometimes we also will do fish bowl in that. We have an object in the middle and we're all observing it and then sharing our ideas. So there's two ways to do it. You can have a person who is essentially being um, gently asked questions, not interrogated, uh, or you can have an object where everyone is around it and we are throwing ideas out and it's a way of almost like it's brainstorming, which is also on this list, but a particular physical setup that allows you to. So you may have that small animal in front of all of us, right? And then people are throwing out ideas and then you move into that next level. Of, like he said, yeah. give an example. If the students are following that case study, I would give them assignments also. Okay, then they'll never forget. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can have five, six, they can cover the same case from five, six angles. Mm -hmm. So they'll have good, broad knowledge. Mm -hmm. Like uh, what could be differentials for hypercalcemia? What could be differentials for say, a low phosphorus or whatever. Mm -hmm. So assignments are also. Absolutely. And that was the question. The first question you asked me this morning was, was if it's a learning outcome in medical schools and we wanted to, it's, it's maybe a core program level learning out. <laughs> then rather just have it in one class or one class only, maybe you have it in every single class mm -hmm. and you want to make sure you teach it differently in every single class and you want to evaluate it. Angles. Yeah. So maybe like it's only those three or four really top ones for a program, whereas your course might have eight or nine or 10 lower ones that support them. And that's what we're doing. We're thinking about different ways we can go back to them. So that knowledge might be the case study that you described. It might be the case study that Dr. Rajneesh was talking about, which is maybe a piece of paper that we look at and then discuss. But all of those are contributing to a broad level of knowledge, disciplinary knowledge and understanding that the students will take away. This is, I'm loving this conversation today. And some good medical schools, like somebody is teaching surgery, so their professor of medicine will also be standing. Mm -hmm. Professor of say, pharmacology may also be standing. Kind of got, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, because they want to look at the same thing from different angles and what could be affections in that part of the mm -hmm. body. Yeah. So multiple teachers are standing in some good medical schools. So that Absolutely. I don't know what to name that strategy. Ah. So what do you I think, think that's going to be a gate, gate study. I would say that my... Right there in the class, there are post professors are standing. Yes. So well, I don't know what to name. That will be problem-based learning case study. That is fine, I think. Uh, like he's an anatomy person, he's taking, holding a That's what Sarjana will also be. If it is on paper, means we need involvement of each of those. Mm -hmm. Like if we are right there in the first it, year, the, all for the example, the Sari is doing these, uh, means live or 84, currently, right? Just in time. That's real life uh, case studies. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you can prepare <laughs> yeah. for case studies. And that is all pathologists. I mean, that happens in internship. Yeah. But right in the first year, people don't have little idea about internship. So when the anatomy person is teaching, surgeon is also there, medicine guy is also there. So 
Because they are telling everything about that part. In, in some of the vet schools uh, in North America, what they do when they teach uh, histology, mm. they start with the gross and then they they go for, they pick up a system, mm. then they go for gross and then histology and then their clinical application. Yeah. But that's going on means every week. Mm. So that they don't go back and mm. once they are starting a applied anatomy, again, they have to read everything. So they do that in, in, in one week. Yeah. Okay, I want to make that system. I want to make a comment about this and then go to your question. The, the beauty of what you are talking about is that these are more. So you're not saying, why do we have four people in the OR? No, you're no. saying it's good. It's why, do we, why are we doing more? It's good. It's important to have that. And I think whatever you call it, and I was trying to figure out if it's a there, jigsaw a or, a real or maybe story. it's um, there's a coaching one, peer coaching, maybe mastery. Those are all, I think. I would say hundred real world applications. Real world applications yeah. again. Your question was just in time teaching. Well, time I don't know. Think of just in time teaching as real <laughs> teaching. <laughs> yeah, just in time teaching is often uh, something that happens on the fly. Do you know when I say on the fly? Like a, st a student comes up with, or maybe there's a particular. Uh, there's a pandemic, for example, and all of a sudden we have to go from this plan that we had at the beginning of the year to drop in some information that is really pertinent and impacting our students. And we are maybe just having our, our own conceptual levels of the subject challenged as we're learning about it. But it is really important that it happens because next week students are going to have to be doing something different that we didn't plan for that notion of, of getting ahead, right? You're a good teacher is at least 24 hours ahead of the students. Well, there's an example of where you might only be an hour or two hours ahead of the students. So that idea of just in time, they need to know it's important uh, and it's dropping in kind of. Uh, this is your type of announcement. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and as I mentioned before, and that was spurred on by your question earlier, the idea that learning outcomes and assessment have to match. So we're not just going into this and saying, oh, wouldn't it be great to do this, to do that, to have a whole bunch of people in the OR? Well, what is what is that doing for the learning outcome and how are we assessing it? Do we have each of those people then doing an assessment or even an evaluation of the students? Are they giving feedback? So we're rather than just choosing something that might be exciting and interesting and different, it has it can't happen in isolation. It has to happen in conjunction with learning outcomes and the the assessment strategy that you have chosen. Any others on this list? There are many. I I think it's fascinating that some of the ones that you're bringing forward. Are you Storytelling. I didn't see story. Yeah, storytelling is very good. Forty three. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. John Glenn. I told things I do. John Glenn. Yeah. The man who invented proper John board. Glenn. The first the man in veterinary so, so exactly. uh, the thing is even in medical field still I mean so about storytelling might be good in your extension. Yeah, critical exercise for the veterinarian. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. these are also important. Yeah. And he got lesser yeah. about in 2019. Questioning why we do what we do, of, not just accepting uh, them. Not just yeah. only questioning, don't, this don't critical try. thinking exercise can be also as a part of my inspired evaluating very well. Yeah. And rather than directly asking uh, some question, we can just Dr. John Glenn. make it a, a guest straight type oh, 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 yeah. okay, So that they have to, rather than oh, and just and going away for the answer, they have to think critically yeah. that oh, part, sugar is what is the case. <laughs> And so when we think about beliefs right. taxonomy, when we're doing when we're doing critical thinking, that's, <laughs> that's at the top. <laughs> okay, right? well, 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 just one example, last one. Like there was, a, <laughs> you I, can't say that. That's like me saying <laughs> that I'm going to be done early. Last one. <laughs> come on, nice try. Go ahead though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I teach third year when the students come to third year, uh -huh. and I give the example in NLC there. The stage, uh, the the stages of anesthesia, uh, they were developed by a guy called William T. G. Morton. Yes, and also Guidel. So Don't William T. G. Morton, yeah. I tell my students, he was just like you, a third year student in a medical school in Boston mm -hmm. in eighteen forty seven, hundred almost you see hundred seventy five or 70, eighty years back. Okay. So if he could demonstrate hundred eighty years back with little technology at that time, stages of ether anesthesia. 
and he did it on October 16, and that is called World Anesthesia Day, October 16. Hmm. So look at the you know sincerity of those people at that time. If they could do as third year students, you can also do something. So that really pulls them. Mm -hmm. So today is World Sparrow Day. What <laughs> Sparrow Day? Okay, oh. so I mean, so you can ways. give any example, but Pets, he was a third year student in medical school, oh, 180 years Most back with days. little technology. Boss is there. Okay, Sparrow. SR domestic. SR domestic. Can, can you, SR domestic. Okay, can you name an Indian who is linked to Sparrows? He's a Salim Ali. Salim Ali. Salim Ali. Yeah, Birdman. Salim Ali. Okay, I'm going to get us back off Sparrows and back to but teaching. But third year, you got back to Arrows. Sparrows to Arrows. Yes. Uh, the Arrows on this. So you could see that lots of conversation. When I leave, you will have to meet once a week and everybody takes a strategy and have a ta have some cha and talk about it. And yes, I much. think there's good opportunity. They forgot who put this, uh, the sugar and both of them put. No. It's very sweet. I don't mind. It's fine. You're not diabetic, right? No, I'm not. Good. I might be diabetic if I have more of these. But... Ultimately, the the strategies that we're choosing are helping our students engage. So we have a deeper level of participation. And when we get to the choice of our teaching strategies, and I agree with with all that you have shared today and what i also like is that you're thinking about your own courses and that's what i was hoping for at the beginning like how would this work for mine and that might not work for mine or maybe it will the way you present it and then the the back and forth that's going on but when you get better participation these are the next level impact so not just hey i felt like my class went well today but your course ratings go up People will say, and I'm thinking of your two examples. So your yeah. first year, compare the course ratings of the first year to the second one that you exactly. talked about. Very here, you said, I don't even want to say his name, right? Where the other one, doctor, like you are proud to say his name, and he probably has very good course so, ratings. ratings are to, yes, 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 yes. This is the other thing that if we have <laughs> students who participate, and I don't know what your attrition rates are here at your university. Attrition being people dropping out, not finishing their program? Does that happen? Uh, it yeah. happened, but yeah. now it happens less. Okay. Less than 5%. Okay, that's good. Uh, <laughs> I can much more. Right. But less than, yeah. So when we have less than 5%. Course completion rates, if it you are, means that the time that you yeah. have spent Bottle. with those students, say you, you start the year with 25 students mm -hmm. and you lose five of them by the end, You've still done a lot of work with those five students. You want them to finish. You don't want them to come back next year and start over. You want to make sure that that time that you mentor them and effective. And so if you have good teaching strategies, you're going to have people who finish more courses and you're not going to have any of that dropout or that attrition. You will have the same 25 or 105 or whatever that you started the year with. You know, usually we lose one or two because of things that are beyond our control, but good teaching strategy selection has a lot to do with that. The other thing is that people will come to class, and I, again, reading the documentation, you can get away with the 75% attendance, right? Like, that's acceptable. Wouldn't it be great if if it was 90, if everybody was there 90% of the time? Then you don't have to spend that extra remedial time. You don't have to have those sessions outside of your regular teaching to do the basic work, you can then talk about exciting things and changes and moving forward. So lower uh, lateness and absenteeism, I think is you know, something that speaks volumes to me. If I have a student who's not coming to class, I worry about them because I think there isn't a fit. There's something that's going on. Often just a conversation with the student makes all the difference in the world. And you can make a minor modification you can layer on a different strategy that might help them. So you might do lecture, but you also might do lecture recording. So they'll come to your lecture and then they'll watch it again outside. And then that helps them with the reinforcement. And that, and that discussion is- Is it allowed, lecture recording? 
I mean, lecture recording, like you are teaching, uh, can they? Yeah. So probably, yeah. probably if you have a facility for lecture uh, yeah. recording. There's no, there's no function. Student can't record, but uh, yeah. if you have a facility for that. Student they record. 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 They yeah. But they Student can't record. record, but they can't go to the social media. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's only used yeah. for teaching. For teaching. Teaching, teaching and learning. Yes. Yeah. We have the same thing. I've had students with uh, visual impairment. Yeah. And so they, they cannot, they're blind, but mm -hmm. they can hear. And so what I would do is I would often record the lecture because they, I go too fast mm -hmm. and they would want to have it afterwards and then be able to go through it. Or if, or if people are unable to go there. And like you said, with the pandemic, a lot more technology mm -hmm. out there. Sometimes it's just a recorder. I'll just pretend that's a recorder or a phone and people would set it up and the quality is not always good. Um, but, uh, but there are ways much like we're doing, we're recording all of these lectures. So you'll be able to, uh, on every weekend, you'll sit down and listen to my voice over and over again. How exciting. No, I didn't think so either. Anyway. Um, the other thing is that if you are using good strategies, you have good participation, you don't worry as much about your class. Now, it says time spent thinking. It should be time spent worrying about the course outside of class hours. Your students don't either. They feel confident that they are getting the knowledge in a way that works best because you've chosen a strategy that is, is most effective. And then again, the last one's kind of funny. Um, you know, people participate, they learn more. I guess that's just a given, but I would put it up there anyway. And, and uh, really a part of, of what we're doing, the, probably the ultimate reason why we're doing that. So we've talked about some of these. Who has a, a favorite teaching strategy that they just love? Do you have a favorite teaching strategy? Well, we have been discussing from the last one hour. No, but what is yours? Yeah, uh, what is yours? theory coupled with practical and better with clinical teaching. Okay. Uh, I love that. Okay. Theory and practical combined. Good. Okay. Other things you want to do. And, and just because I gave you this list doesn't mean you have to go, oh, where's mine on the list? You can just say what you do and why. Like you like case studies. You told me yeah. that, right? Case studies I usually do for post-grad yeah. students, the grad students. And yeah. So, but for undergrad students, Eggman. sometimes for Eggman. diseases, for example, for Q fever in the last uh, class. So, we start with the history of Q fever. So, it was a story about the disease, how it yeah. was started, how it was named Q fever, and how it goes. So, during that story means students were able to learn what are the symptoms of that disease, how it could be uh, diagnosed, how it could be controlled. So, from that history, so beautiful. Yeah. And and storytelling engages people because it gives it a context and it gives it what you can remember. Why why do we sing songs with messages? Because people remember the me the song, the beat, the music. It's always easier when we have a mnemonic. And it's the same thing when we do storytelling or case case stories, case studies, or hands on. It gives us that ability to go back and remember what we did because we touched something and we did something. Other favorite ways. Or do you all just lecture? We have we do lecture. Yeah. Definitely. But do you like the lecture? So mm -hmm. in, in that way means we will be able to finish all the syllabus on time. Okay. That is one of the reasons. The other thing means we need to the the, the ways the you are telling the we need to fit them into the our lectures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is how we do that. So it's not all lectures we are doing storytelling or we are doing these kind of case studies. No. So it could be kind of, for example, for me, it's only 20-25% of the whole uh, course. So you said you're a good presenter. Thank you. Do you like to lecture? Yeah. Do people get excited? When, yeah. Is it like a rock concert when uh, you lecture? Not a rock all? concert, but yes, we have theory courses. In those theory courses, we have, I think, uh, 40 minutes or 50 minutes of class. So then you have to give yeah. You have to present. Yeah. And yes, for practical, uh, for example, always uh, from last three years, I am having a practical course of examination of head and neck. Mm -hmm. So what I do is first I make students sit for around half to half hour to forty five minutes. I just demonstrate them what's what they can demonstrate on themselves basically. Mm -hmm. For example, where is thyroid? The way you can palpate thyroid. Mm -hmm. Where is liver? Where is spleen? Your own liver, your own spleen. Mm -hmm. So I think I make them understand that on their own bodies. If they are going 
if you are doing ophthalmic examination, then what is Menans reflex? What is palpebral reflex? I learned what is your PMR. I make them do on themselves. I ask them to follow the torch, one student, and then check the, the people response. Mm -hmm. So first they do on themselves, then I take them to clinics. <laughs> then I make Perfect. them to do on dog. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> That's the awesome. thing I did taught them. Like yeah. that. Go ahead and I awesome. see how enthusiastic you are about it. Hmm. Because you know it works, right? Yeah. And it's a way of using what you have in the time you have to get those concepts, like concept attainment, right? Like, did the pupil change? No? Yeah. Uh-oh. Then maybe your classmate has a concussion <laughs> or something like that, right? Maybe they drank too much coffee. Yeah. Those are great examples. Other thing, I'm, I'm thinking about your 105 class. What, what are you doing in your 105 class? And for every, uh, this, uh, every uh, chapter, we used to go for theory class first, mm -hmm. uh, teaching all the 105 students around the theory part. Then in practical class for demonstration of practical and importance of those uh, that are taught in the theory class, then students are allowed to do the practicals uh, themselves. Okay. And from that, we used to assess what is the problem, any doubts, any confusion, what so that we need to clarify. Wonderful. So we've got lecture, demonstration, independent learning, formative assessment on your part. Great. And maybe you didn't see it that way before, but that's what I see. I see all of those teaching strategies as well as your assessment to ensure that they are successful and build their confidence. And if you have 105 students, you have to have some self-directed learning because you can't be there to show them how to go through it and, and have that opportunity. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. You were going to say something else. No? Good. I thought you were going to keep talking and I jumped in. Nice. Other favorites for teaching strategies? Or ones that you have yeah, thought about so trying? One thing I just want to add, I might be doing something different than. So I always thought, like, had I been in the place of the student, mm. what what they want from a teacher. Correct. So I go to the level of the students. Mm. Okay. And then each and every lecture, whatever the important is, I keep on repeating those things. Mm. And third thing what I do is in the lecture, I always highlight the things which I'll ask in the exam. Mm. Okay, so then they will definitely going to stress on those practical points. I always tell them beforehand, this part will come in the exam. This, I, this portion or this point will come in the exam. Mm -hmm. So you have to put yourself in Absolutely. seat of the student. But sometimes it backfires also. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love all those strategies and I do those too. So that's it. Okay, how does Some it backfire? Students told me, sir, you were telling that this is very important. We studied it, never came. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think... <laughs> Didn't we talk about that last week from assessment? Only assess on what is being taught. Then I am yeah. now I have shifted my gear. No idea. It is important from your veterinary practice point. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. That's a practical point. That I always repeat the practice. Think you be exam cha sa da. No, like I I put those when I was not hundred percent, but at least eighty percent of the points which I discuss, I always put. Peter, you never, never tell them also that never this can come as short answer, this can come as descriptive, this can come as true and false. Yeah, but so it's a dark, it teacher. will sometimes miss fires. Yeah. Many times. Bullet will not be a tracer bullet. No, no bullet. And that's for yeah. external only. For internal, we are sure. We but we are dealing really with important. external system, so we have to give external them notes. a plethora of notes. Yeah. Like Telling us, keep them short and sweet, crispy. Crispy. So crispy <laughs> is sometimes. <laughs> he is in the dean's chamber. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, he is in the dean's. We saw him this morning. We talked to him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He is in the dean's chamber. But you're right. It, it, there, are, there are different ways to do it. And the beauty of this is, once again, much like your teacher identity, you're going to do things your way. Yes. And the, the ultimate feedback will be, are your students successful and graduating? And do they know what's going on? Okay. And, and you have the autonomy to make those changes and, and do what you think is best. That's the, the beauty of the work you do. And if your heart is in the right place, then we'll try things that, again, they don't work. You modify them. You do it a little bit differently. But you see the big picture. The students don't see the big picture, and sometimes that's the difficult part. Like, and they may say, well, yeah, this doesn't feel important. And you will say, this is important. And just because it's on the exam, it's important because when the exams are done, you're going to be standing in a field next to someone, and you really need to know what you're talking about and how to, to apply this task or to have a discussion around it. You talked about why some things are maybe better. plus yeah. advanced yeah. teaching. Yeah. So you used all the audio visual aids, but 
chalk and duster teaching mm -hmm. there is no substitute yes chalk and duster yeah like okay. we have many nematodes you know? so i just now am telling them if you remember the picture you can write the characters mm -hmm. if you don't remember the pictures then it is difficult because quantum of syllabus is much 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 yeah but you the point i wanted to make is but you were also talking about how some of these fit really well with extension activities yeah. that we will often be leading as well and that idea of if students are in your courses they're used to maybe working differently because they see a focus in terms of their learning and their development as a vet but when you are then out teaching with people in the public sometimes the content isn't as important it is but you have to find ways of getting them engaged because they don't see themselves as students they may see themselves as ranchers farmers producers however and so some of these more innovative ones that you may not have tried before sometimes are a better fit with extension as opposed to what you do in your classroom and i think your example of of you know the your 105 class that's a that's a brilliant way that's what 90 percent of us do this is what we're going to do here's the background try it try it on your own and then i'll give you some feedback uh, like you say that's that's the foundational part of, of teaching and learning and hasn't changed for a really long time we can we can spend more money on phones and gizmos but that at the core is often that that really important traditional form of teaching yeah. strategies yeah. the the methodology that we would use you have a handout in front of you that looks like this and i was hoping that in our conversations we would pick off some of the teaching strategies and i think you have so i was looking i did some research before I came here because I am not a vet. I don't teach in veterinary medicine, but I was looking for some of the ideas that might be applicable. Uh, and and you're already talking about these. You're talking about case base. So right off the bat, that was the, one of the first ones that came up. Clinical rounds. Again, you're lucky enough to have a hospital here. You have lots of opportunities to do clinical simulation both uh, artificial simulation as well as the demonstration type simulation that you're doing. PBL, I talked to um, Dr. Singh, Baljeet Singh about, he came and did some PBL stuff. If you have to go, that's not a problem. Um, experiential learning, and Dr. Sani was on that right away. He went right to number 100, real world applications. I mean, that's, that's around what you should be doing. If you're trying to teach people to be vets and you're not out in the real world, if you're not getting some dirt on your boots, and uh, then really that's uh, not doing them any kind of service at all. Technology, I just kind of with bad mouthing technology, but there are applications, even something as simple as going to Google and seeing videos that other people have created around, you know, pathology, for example, around different animals, around genetic mutations that maybe you can't uh, have enough lab time. All of those things are really good uses of technology. Standardized patients. Now, I wondered about this. Do you have, is there such thing as a standardized animal patient? Standardized means? Standardized means, so in, if you are in uh, medicine for humans, a standardized patient would be someone who would come in and they would present certain symptoms. So they might present as someone with liver, liver problems or something like that. Do you have that with animals too? Yeah, they've got a farm where they do uh, uh, parental exams. So they've got those animals, okay. standard animals. I mean. Instructional livestock. Yeah. Oh, herd. instructional livestock. Instructional herd. Okay. Yeah, instructional herd. I love that. I'm writing yeah, it down. Instructional herd is there right across the okay. building. So its main purpose is just for Speaking. students to work with. Yeah. Okay. LFP course is there, right? Livestock farm practice. Okay. Yeah. L, L, there is LFP. Course. Like in some countries, they have got when they want to make the uh, students practice for suturing, they have got a special siliconized yeah, the, cadavers yeah, so that you can get cadavers. almost a similar feeling because you cannot make them practice sutures on an animal. Mm -hmm. So, before speaking in CFK, we, we uh, uh, there was when we used to uh, study. Take one dog or okay. and then practice some culture on it and then trade it for any by the side people. But now it's not uh, yeah. CPCSC guideline, so it's uh, you can say punishment or against animal welfare laws. Yeah. Okay. So that's why I wondered about that if if there is animal animal welfare issues to be when laws were not so strict. Yeah. 
No, we have an ethical committee, very strong ethical Very strong ethical yeah. committee. So you have to take the allow us to work. <laughs> <laughs> no, acting like a true you. professor. No, no. Yes. <laughs> it is because Spoken like a true professor. Everybody will <laughs> perform the <laughs> operation, but yeah. uh, post operative care, <laughs> nobody <laughs> will. <laughs> uh, so, so the animal is a huge suffer. Yeah. This is why this was the first time. Ah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Neither work nor allow the uh, Okay, so we got hung up on standardized practice or patients, but now I know I appreciate that. And I, yes, ethics is, I have my own thoughts about ethics as well. Small group discussions, and, and we'll talk about that. Reflective practice as well. And that notion of critical thinking, um, Dr. Randier, Randier, right? Yes, he mentioned that idea of critical thinking. Instead of just being a student that there's only one flow, you want students to be able to come to you and say, I was thinking about this on the weekend and it didn't feel right and it doesn't seem right. And do we always have to do it that way? And it may give you a chance to explain things differently, but it also starts to move their, their brains into other areas in terms of, I don't just read and accept and this is the, this is the law. If I experience something, because you have given all of these innovative teaching strategies. If I have my hands on an animal and it's not right, and I'm, I'm thinking about it differently, how can we then have that discussion? And that's what you want to encourage uh, the students that are here with us. We, we want you to think differently. We want you to challenge. We want you to, to say 50-50 assessment, not that 40-40-10-10, right? We, that's that critical thinking and why it's important. You thought I forgot about that, but I, won't, I don't forget about things like that. Uh, reflective practice because you want people to be reflective practitioners when they are done as well. Uh, I want to ask you one, one last question and then we'll take a little bit of a break because you've been sitting and I've been talking a lot. What is the most unusual teaching strategy that you've done? Take a little bit of time just to think mm -hmm. about it. Maybe you've done. That's unusual. This I learned from a professor of a med okay, school. You have to hold on. Which one? This one. He asks his uh, students to draw this. Circadian rhythm. No, no, no. Okay, it's just wait. You have to hold it. They're thinking. You have 30 seconds, and then I'll start with you. And okay. if somebody cannot? Okay, okay. What's that? <laughs> Unusual teacher study you have ever tried. Okay, this is the one. Okay. Time is over. Five. Come on, hurry up, man. I think I'll give you an extra minute. Oh, God. You're killing us. <laughs> Five, four, one. Uh, last off. All right. Who has an innovative or unusual teaching strategy they would like to share? Yeah. Dr. Sani? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, all these words, <laughs> I asked you to draw this in the class. You remember? And if somebody cannot draw this, there's a symptom of an important uh, group of drugs that I teach, anticonvulsants. If you cannot draw this, it means something wrong with your hands, stability of your hands. So you better get checked for, say, initial symptoms of convulsions. Well, the initial symptoms of epilepsy are just this. You cannot draw it in circles. And this I learned from a head of neuro department in DMs, uh, Dayanand Medical College. Medical School is here. So he told me. So this is the latest I learned. And, Unusual. And does it work? That's oh, pretty yeah. innovative. That's you're innovative. Right. I'm going to draw it later. <laughs> I'm going to draw it later where you're not going to diagnose me. So. Okay. Good. And... So he shared it with you, yeah. and you thought it would be good to put in yeah. to your classroom. Mm. What do students think about it? Uh, well, most of them, they drew it, and they, they really liked it. Yeah. Because that's a real-life example. Mm -hmm. The first thing that head in uh, med school will do is make his patient draw this. If, he, if anybody having trembling hands, some people have, you know, drink a lot of coffee, caffeine, so a lot of trembling hands, or somebody having stressed out, some tumor... Uh, nidus in brain. Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing which comes. You cannot draw it in circles. I have very trembly hands, so I'm a little nervous. Uh, so I'm going to draw this afterwards. Okay. So that's the, 
So Just creating creating good graphics, what I you may have noticed on all of my slides, I try to make them colorful and engaging and whatnot, because if I just put words there, yeah, that's not boring. helpful. It's yeah. boring. So I, like you, I'm not very good when it comes to drawing, mm -hmm. but I'm okay when it comes to using photographs. And that's why I took 500 photographs at Rock City yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, I take pano graphic, like wide shots because they look really good on the screen whenever I go. So I have the Punjabi pano. I've taken a whole bunch of those on my trips. Some are shaky in the at night and some are calm in the morning. No. Um, <laughs> but you're right, something like that, it seems like a really straightforward innovation, but it helps students because then they've got a complete set of notes. It's not whatever you draw on the chalkboard. Do you see what I draw on the chalkboard? It's not like that circle. It's It would be worse than you would ever see. But I use PowerPoint as much as possible. Even if I don't use it in the class, if I do a lecture, I make a PowerPoint available online so students can download it and have the notes organized. Yeah, have well, yeah. well, yeah. yeah. Good. So good use of technology. Other innovative strategies that people have used. Anything really different? Yes. Did you have one? No? Okay. I thought you were like taking a deep breath to share. I thought I heard a noise over there. Okay. Oftentimes, people won't use something different because they're afraid of failure. Mm -hmm. And trying something different and not coming across as the expert is the worst thing in the world for a lot of people, and especially at a university. But what that does when you draw a circle or use PowerPoint or you do something different and it doesn't work, people see you as a human being. It breaks down those kind of hierarchies that may exist in the classroom. You can have a good laugh about it. Uh, you can ask students what they might do differently, or they come to your aid and they say, we understand we've made mistakes too. Let's work through this together. Why it's important to keep pushing and trying different things is because then you end up with that same old professor that should have retired many years ago, who are just bringing their same notes and they say the same thing over and over again. And students don't want that. They want some variety in, in what's going on. They want the opportunity to see things in a more exciting way. Even if you're just updating your pictures or photographs from year to year on your PowerPoint slides, because it seems, you know, that is that can be simple, but engaging for students and makes them realize that you do review the, the material that you have. You're trying to be as up to date as possible. You tell more current stories so, Dr. Rajneesh, you you know, maybe something happened that week before. You had a story you've always told, and then all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, I can tell a new one because students will be exposed to that and, and something uh, something different happens. So that's, again, why I'm trying to get you to think about um, that in terms of, of being creative. Let's take uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Walk around, stand up. You can drop not, not 25. Open Open what type of learning is best for you? <laughs> Why do your strategies okay. match? So you've talked about, we've talked about uh, options and choices. Now I've asked you about what you've done, some of the innovation you have done. But well, what do you think works best when it comes to your material? So if you're only just focused on not being innovative, delivering as you feel most confident, what type of 
learning strategies or teaching strategies would work best? Theory coupled with practical. Mm-hmm. And that's right. it. Theory plus practical. Very practical. Yes. Okay. Both, both. Demonstrated. You see? We're nodding. Yeah. Sir William Osler, you heard of him? I just did. Okay. Yeah. You know, before I mean, okay. no. he was founder of John Hopkins. Okay. He was yes, founder. I have. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So he used to say, learning medicine without patients mm-hmm. is like sailing an uncharted ship. Teaching theory without patients is just, you know, useless thing. Yep. So theory with practical is the most important. So do you agree with Dr. Sani's answer to question two? Why do your strategies match? Because I think that's why you just said that. Because there is no reason to do it if you don't have those strategies, yeah. right? You don't have that. Good. Um, it's going to work. we we'll go to the next one. Next. Moody. It's Moody. Mm. There you go. Next. Aha, there. So we talked about chat GPT the other day. Mm. So I went to chat GPT and I typed in Indian post-secondary teaching learning strategies. And this is what I came up with. So when we're thinking about what we do, we have to think about what our students experience has been and what skills they have. So I don't know if any of these are right. So I'm just putting them in front of you because I had an AI robot create them. And we know that chat GPT is not spot on. Uh, But do you see that these as being valid in terms of what your students may have experienced in their own lives before Mm. they come here? Most important is number one. Mm. Okay. So so that's something that they are used to being close to their teachers and mentoring. Yeah. This is starting from the schooling. Yeah. From the nursery. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So storytelling as well. We've talked a bit about that. Yeah. Storytelling, it depends upon the subject. Yeah. Correct. But, but most of your students will have had storytelling. They're inspired their, by yeah. stories. Yeah. Good. Uh, learning through yoga and meditation? Uh, uh, I don't think so. No. I mean, sometimes in it NSS works. Says, uh, NSS activities on these. In NSS, I okay. think they do this. But we never practice in our times. No. Huh? Yeah. So I'm just thinking in terms of if we talk about reflection and the ability to be mindful and whatnot, in terms of the content that you're using or the or the teaching you're doing, does that mean that you know your students can be self-critical and self-reflective because they may have done yoga and meditation, they are able to focus better and that helps them? Yeah, I think, think that's what they say. Yeah. But in old times, yeah. they, the students used to work you physical work so much mm-hmm. that they need not do yoga. Nowadays, people don't do physical work, so now they need yoga. So maybe it helps now, but in old, I mean, when we were students, we used to do a lot of hands-on physical work. So yeah. yoga did not matter to us yeah. because we already were, you know, hardworking. Okay. Yoga is just a way of for those who are not uh, working physically much. Okay. Uh, role models. So you are role models for your students. Do you feel that that is something that you continue to do here in this capacity? Our teachers as the role models. Yes, number nine, yeah. I would say. Yeah. One and nine. Multilingualism. It's there. Yeah. yeah. So you you were talking about extension, uh, right? Extension. Multilingual yeah. kids are more intelligent. Yeah. Okay. Multilingual. Yeah, it develops brain better because yeah. So, so that's the age of institute is also is the one oh, yeah. thing that should be inculcated in our students. Yeah. Like we studied inbreeding should not be there. We did postgraduate in Uttar Pradesh. Mm. We learn their culture and IVRI is mini India. Mm. People will come from many places. Yeah. So you learn about their culture, this their traditions, and then you assess yourself where you are. Correct. You might think here I am here, mm. and you go to IVRI, you know you are a rat. Yeah. <laughs> a rat. So so in inbreeding, yeah, should not be there. It's yeah. they must go to other institute. Also. And our institute also has a lot of you know. Uh, uh, people from different parts of the country, mm. almost every department. So it's really good, not only your students, but people who are teaching in your departments. They are from various places. Yes. And that sometimes that can be especially helpful if, for example, if students come here and they are from a different part of the country mm. and, you know, language is, okay. yes, they can speak and write and work in English, but maybe it helps build those connections with students if you are using... 51 to 52% faculty at Gadabasu is from other yeah. state. 
Perfect. 48 to 49% is from Punjab domicile. So that's why this is number one. Other states, they don't have that much. In know. other states, it might be 10%. Mm, not more than 10%. 10%. His heart doesn't even have 5%. Hello, Appa. <laughs> So we talked about one percent hands-on learning. So again, your students are coming here and they're used to doing things like lab work, field trips, and so you post, can continue in, to in post doc in doctoral PhD. Yeah. You, but what about in in high school? They have done in high training, school right? uh, hands-on training, like in a lab, even like a no, no, lab. No, Did you? No. I'll ask the students. Ah, uh, in plus one and plus two. Yeah. You will have some lab trainings. Yeah. In chemistry class. Yeah. Physics Bio also. Biology. Biology, learn dissection of yeah. heart, goat heart. There you go. And good. So that's, well, that's a good but We're talking about if you if you to, to otherwise you have coming to your, at hand, we had to bring the lung uh, yes. heart of the goat. No, nowadays stop our cell. Yeah. No, 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 because then the butcher will provide you with animal parts. Yeah, uh, after matriculation, organ is stuff. Yep. Uh, there. Uh, guest lectures. Guest lectures are IDP there in this IDP pro project. Yeah. Many guest Bringing lectures. People in. And that's where technology, if you've had guest lectures, again, I'm talking about the students in your high school experience, then you know that when you bring someone in on video that you pay attention and you take notes, and that is something that you can use in the as faculty members in the development of, of what you're doing, because you don't have to say, okay, this person is going to come online and we're going to pay attention and we're going to learn from this. They know that you're bringing that person in for a reason, not just to fill time. And I think that's really good. Debate and discussion, we've seen a lot of that uh, here. And that might be something that your students aren't comfortable with because they're used to being receivers of knowledge. Correct. And we want to change that. Or maybe they have come from a, a more progressive school where they've had that opportunity to have more say in what's going on. If if that's not the in case, PhD discussion will have yeah. more discussion. That. Yeah. Undergraduate service and learning that is has been part of you know Indian culture. Yeah. So working I, in the community for me, yeah. uh, if, if we have to follow our uh, Indian culture style teaching, I would say one, two, and nine that fits well. Mm -hmm. What about ten? Arts and crafts, yeah. Because when I when I tour, because I've toured Punjab extensively in the last three days, I see a lot of people doing hands on. That's why we have those five marks. So that's yes, Arts. traditional. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some people well, have these. You no, know, our student goes to uh, our youth festival is there. So photography is there. And our painting One line most, competitions are yeah. there, extempore is there, debate is there. Perfect. So it might not be on this subject, the professional one, but the other one, our students are uh, yes, sorry, have been able to you can say it is a co-curricular part. Yeah. And if not, not of a part of a curriculum, yeah. not a mandatory, but a co-curricular part. Makes you a four day a four or five day youth yeah. festival is there every year at our university. There are off stage events, there are on stage events. So students are perfect. I think they brought runners up trophy this time. Yes. You know, yes. huh? yes. Our university students are runners up in interagri yes. out of 65 universities. Yeah. Our university yeah. students yeah. brought yeah. loads yeah. of yeah. oh. so, so what I'm hearing from you is that there is confidence in many all of these. Yes. All these things that yes. And when you are thinking about what you want to do with your students. If they have had these as, as skill development opportunities, mm -hmm. then you can build them into your work and expect them to be successful. If there are things that they haven't done, you may have to back up and you may have to do some pre-teaching, some pre-learning so that they understand. We don't say, okay, here is a here is our case study. Does everyone know how to read? Because that's silly. But we may say, okay, we are going to a visit. A particular goat farm today and these are the expectations this is what so for some things they may not have had experience with you have to walk them back and allow them to create a framework or a way of dealing with that so that they get the most out of the educational experience if you don't prepare them then they're going to go they'll come back and be like oh well, what were we supposed to <laughs> like you said set them up right away what's important what's on the exam what are we going to be evaluating and and that is that hyper focus that helps them 
to make sure they get the important stuff. They may miss a few of the other details, right? There's that core bit of knowledge. You want them focused on that. And if they can do that next ring on their own, great. But really that that core ball of knowledge at the, at the middle is, is really important. And being aware of this and your role in each of these is, uh, is really crucial to their success. So again, when you're thinking about the teaching strategy that you choose, you have a reason for doing it. And hopefully this is starting to sound really repetitive. You're like, Jay, you're just driving us into the ground today. But it is. You can't just pick things because they're fun. You can't just pick things because you you are good at it and you like it. It has to be related to what's going on. We talked about the idea of outcomes. Again, learning outcomes. Is what you're doing traceable back to the outcomes in the mm -hmm. course? Mm -hmm. It has to be because there's no be. point in doing it if, if not. Uh, again, we've talked about alternates. If there's something you can do differently or is this uh, just what everybody has always done all the time and that will just be what we do. I work with lots of colleges of engineering and they basically a lecture or a teaching strategy in engineering is to go through a PowerPoint deck as fast as possible and have students take notes because that's their default strategy. I say, do you have a lesson plan? What is that? <clears throat> do you have uh, some kind of indication of what you're going to do in class? No, nope. I stand up in front of 200 students with my clicker and I blast through 200 slides and that that's teaching. In my mind, that's not teaching, but for a lot of engineering classes, that's what they do. And they come, they come to me to say like, how do we do this differently? How can we be better? That's a big change because every college of engineering basically is driven by PowerPoint slides going by as fast as possible. And then the students learn on their own afterwards, not ideal. It's why we have such high failure rates in a lot of engineering schools and people who are actually not as, as well qualified as they should be. Not to pick on engineering, I know this is being recorded, but that's the group that has come to me the most. And at, at my university, we've tried to really reimagine how we do instruction. So it's more competency-based, much like what goes on in, in, this, uh, in this college and school. Um, are you being careful and deliberate in thinking? And, and I'm getting that sense from what you're doing here, but you are expected to now coach your colleagues. So in moving forward, this group of people will have an important leadership role. So you want to say, here are some options, and you don't want people to just pick something off the list and do it. You want them to think about it. You want them to be critical. You want them to ask you questions about it and come up with a, a teaching strategy that makes sense because they have, have given it lots of uh, deliberate process. Sometimes you, you try things out. And you put together a, a lesson and you share it with your colleagues and you say, well, do you think this would work? There's nothing wrong with doing that. And you get their feedback, their caring feedback. And there are things that you hadn't considered that often come up when you share with, with other people. Because this is what we are doing with our students. We're venturing into uncertainty. So it's not going to be stress-free and it's not going to be without ambiguity. It's not going to be without dead ends and potholes and pitfalls and all of those things. Because if we're, if we're not having those experiences, why are we doing it? Mm. We could just stay home and read a book about being a vet and then we would be a vet. But no, we want to challenge our students. We want to give them those opportunities to feel discomfort and get through it. And then realize that wasn't so bad. And now I know something I didn't know previously. What's that, Barnett 2007, 147? That's the reference. 147, what is That's the page. page, 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 page. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so how do we do that? No. How do we take students into those places of uncertainty? I thought it's from Bible, something they like. No. <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> oh, is like that? No, no Bible uh, stuff from me. <laughs> you could. But no this, problem. This is what we, this is what we want to do. We want to think about how we take them into those places of uncertainty. And again, Dr. Rana, I'll go back to you that you want to put yourself in the place of the students. Yeah. yeah. And when you came in there, you didn't know everything. None of us did when we entered. So we have to remind that we can't just be racing through things. We have to realize that this at one time was really scary for us. And we have to create an environment that 
allows them to still be scared, but knowing that if they fall, we will be there to catch them as they go through it. That notion of venturing into uncertainty. So, so here's our bumper sticker, carefully chosen strategy that engages them in the material and creates a safe place to learn. If students come into your courses and they read this and they feel that this is the at the heart of what you're doing, then they're going to be with you. They're going to say, this is going to be hard, but I appreciate the fact that you care enough about me as a learner and as a person to challenge me in a way that doesn't harm me, but challenges me in a way that allows me to grow. And we grow along with them. And I think that that is, that is the bonus that... We, uh, we don't like to share or admit, but we teach because of the joy, enthusiasm, and the experiences of our students. We take that away. That's what I get excited about every time I get in front of a classroom, is that I have a group of energetic, engaged, interested people, and then I can take that energy and use it for my own recharging. So some of the common strategies, we're narrowing our, down our list of 100. We're going to talk about... Just an overview of some of the ones that, that maybe you might have used. As I do case studies, or as, as I use case studies, they are often written specifically for learning or written specifically for my content. So it's often a handout and there's some background information and a problem. And I give it to students and I turn them loose on it a bit and then I bring them back and then I turn them loose a bit more because they've had a chance to demonstrate their learning. And we have this back and forth around case studies. I guide it. I don't give them answers. They work collectively. They play off one another. They go and look up information. They're on their phones trying to find things or they have readings, but it is an opportunity to move into an authentic situation in my classroom without having to go. Now, I appreciated the way that you used the definition of case study as well. So rather than the, the printout, it might be an animal, it might be data, and they take that data away and then they go and find out who they might interact with to, to come up with the solution. This is a, a really great example of student-focused or student-centered learning. This isn't a lecture, it can be messy, you may have groups that get it completely mistaken and go off in another direction because they didn't read properly or they haven't asked for guidance or they missed a, a, a clue and no one was brave enough in their group to say, I don't think so, or I think we're wrong. So it builds those interpersonal skills as well and that, that ability to look at something objectively, subjectively, uh, in a community-type focus it sounds like people here use case studies and are, are really happy with it. Here's, like, here's an example that I would use. So I teach, I teach design, for example, and this is one where uh, an oil company is trying to set up in a, in a community and how can this happen so that they can be connected to the community and do a better job of what's going on. So they would read through that and then I would just basically turn them loose. So a case study doesn't have to be a lot. Uh, when I was doing my MBA, uh, lots and lots of case studies in the business world and we would have like Harvard Business Review and they would be six, seven, eight pages, lots of detail. We would go through lots of real life experiences as well. And we would use that as uh, a target for our bullet. So our learning bullet would be the, the knowledge and the target would be the case study. And we'd have to look at it and we would underline and tear it all apart and, and take pieces of it and use that as our way of applying and then writing something up to share. How many here people here use case studies? Besides Rajneesh, yes. And you heard your version of case studies, yes. Okay, good. All right, so there's case studies. PBL. PBL is fantastic. It's where we, is this your student? Yeah. Congratulations, Thank you, sir. doctor. Yes, yes. he's Snail from Bombay. Oh, okay. 
He just completed a PhD on Friday. Yes. That's why you have a big smile on your face. That's good. The clouds are lifting. The sun is shining on you. Yes. I think we all know how that feels. Good for you. PBL, uh, I love the term wicked problem. I don't know if you've heard of wicked problems. So we have those regular problems in life. We have difficult problems. And then we have wicked problems. Some that are just so challenging and so difficult to get through. And don't have an obvious solution. And when it comes to problem-based learning, oftentimes we can give students a really complex problem without any background information. And, and the idea is that they have to get through it. They have to use whatever resources are at their disposal or learn about new skills and strategies that they haven't done in the past. Uh, your job is just to make sure that people are running out of the door or crying or upset or fighting in their groups because problem-based learning is, is often so vague and so nuanced that people aren't even sure where to go. With a case study, often we are giving them a background and, a, and more of a structure, but when we're talking about problem-based learning, it may just be a simple sentence. That's you know? like part of an MBA program. Yep. Yeah. So you are a facilitator. Uh, the idea, though, is once the students get going, then you step back. With a case study, you may keep coming back to it and helping them understand. But with a problem-based learning, it's, it's uh, amazing. Uh, you talk about presentations and giving students the opportunity to share. The good assessment for PBL is to have like a sharing fair or have them make a poster or some kind of presentation on the problem. And you may have a, a group that all has the same problem, but they all come up with different solutions to it. It's absolutely fantastic. It's, a, it's amazing to watch. It's a miracle. And it is, it's one of those things where students trick themselves into learning because they get really engaged. And the question, and, and you say, how many hours did you put into this? Because you're only supposed to do five hours and they're like, oh, we worked all weekend and all night and we put in 60 hours. Really? It was so exciting and it went by quickly and we were all so enthusiastic about it. This is a, this is a great way sometimes to open a course. So on your first day of the course, to give them uh, a problem-based learning type assignment. They start to learn about each other. They start to learn about what they don't know. Sometimes that's the most important thing is knowing what you don't know, that conscious incompetence stage of learning. And, uh, and they work, like it says here, collaboratively in small groups, really build some, some strong relationships and, and some ideas of, of how to solve problems without any kind of structure. Uh, this is another good one, debating. Uh, we, people have talked about ethics. So this is kind of ethical within your course. So this is outside of the ethics committee. So this is actually a good thing uh, where you would maybe divide up your class and give them uh, an opportunity to take a position on one side of an argument. So using stray dogs for suture practice is something that we should do. It's very important. It doesn't matter. And so they take, one person takes one side, one person takes the other, and they research it. And they show how there's nothing better than using stray dogs because there's no cost involved and they don't have to worry about the dog's care afterwards. And it's something that uh, they're, uh, they can do in their own neighborhood when they go home. Well, they can just find dogs. The stray dogs, uh, you do spay and neuter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or something like that. Yeah. Because suturing is just deliberately cutting in there. Yeah. yeah. Spay, the spay and neuter, you would Perfect. do everything and do suturing also. And also take care of the menace of huge stray dog population. Perfect. See, so that's why it's a good thing. Maybe on that side, but Whereas the other side of the debate care. Might, might be what you're doing is creating disease. Post operative care. Diseased animals running around, uh, torturing them, animal welfare. And so you can see how a team debate might be a really good way of seeing both sides of it. The idea behind this is if you do debates, and I'm trying to think of that, I think I have, uh, yeah, mock trials is the other one. So it's like you go in front of a judge and a jury and those. The key to these ones is making sure that the students, you set it up properly 
and that if you get sent to one side or the other, it doesn't mean it, it's part of your value system because it can be really tough when you assign someone who is a dog lover to the side of spay and neutering and suturing stray dogs and not worrying about them. Uh, and you also have to have the idea that uh, we are here to do deep research and share ideas. And no one is right and no one is wrong, but it's a chance to move back and forth. And this is another one where people get very passionate, excited, spend a lot of time on the subject, more time than you would normally have them do because they're working in teams and they want, they want to win. Even though it's not supposed to be about winning, each side wants to put together a valid argument in terms of why one might be the other. Uh, as you have there, some students can be the judges and they could say this group put together a more well-researched argument. So we feel that they are the winners in this debate, but we're all winners because we are learning about both sides of a particular ethical issue. Uh, same thing with the mock trials where you can have someone be the judge and you can have a group of students be the jury. So they have to be convinced as to why one side of the argument is better than the other. The castle is built here. Yeah. Yes. I think that's the Supreme Court of Canada. Oh, really? Yeah, the building in, in, in Ottawa. That's my home, yeah. That's my bedroom right in the middle. Okay. Uh, here's another one, a scavenger hunt or treasure he hunt. He has a big home. Yeah, yeah. this guy. Mansion. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you work in collaboration. Yeah, I think so. Uh, this is where you give people a small number of questions and you can send them to the library, to Google, to whatever. Wow. And there is some pressure to find out the answers. And then you come back and have a group discussion. So today we're going to have a discussion about pathology. And here are six questions I want you to answer. And then when we come back together, they will be informed, <laughs> as opposed to you going through a lecture like you have normally done. This gets them the opportunity. They'll find new things. They'll find different things. No group or no person will find the same things. And when you come together, you have shared knowledge. Uh, and these always lead to really good discussions. Very similar to what the outcome might be similar to what you have with a lecture and a discussion, but it's a more active form of, of learning for the students. Uh, jigsaw, this is a really good one as well. Uh, I thought it might've applied to the multiple people in the OR room that we talked about, that Dr. Standing talked about this morning, but this is different. So if you have a, a, an issue or some content, then you give people a part of it. So rather than look at the entire thing, you get them to take this part away and you research the beginning of this disease. And the other group may talk about treatment of the disease and one might say characteristics of it. And when you come together, you share. So each group shares with the larger group. And in the end, everyone is exposed to the same information. You may have the groups each prepare a paper that they then give to everyone in the class. So it allows you to have a learning resource that is written by students for students on a particular area. And the idea of a jigsaw is like a jigsaw puzzle, right? Each piece is important, but when you put them all together, then you get the whole picture. That's that's one strategy that people do. Has, has anyone done this before? Have you used something like this before? Jigsaw? No? Okay. It's a lot of fun. Students like it. Students, you'll like it. Trust Provided me. they have time. Yes. Uh, flip classroom. How about this one? Is this a new one that you're, you've used before? Uh, so a flip classroom is often takes advantage of other materials or in particular video lectures or online material that you have prepared and a student can read it outside of class time. And then they come into class and then your, your class time or your together time is only spent discussing and learning further. So are they trying to learn the use of yoga and back pain? I think so. Yeah. I don't know what that is. I, that's a random picture. That is not one that I took. Yeah, they're trying to learn that. Yeah. Is, yeah. Maybe it's yoga. No, abs. They are doing crunches. Maybe abs or crunches. They are doing crunches. Too much roti. They have to do crunches. Yeah. So again, this is putting more emphasis on you initially to create the resources. Uh, but it, what it can often do is leverage 
other resources that are available. So if you use YouTube, for example, sometimes there's some really good uh, TED Talks mm. or guest speakers and mm. whatnot. And so you ask the students to watch that. Mm. And then the next day, you come in and have a conversation about the content. It, it again, means there's more time devoted to learning. So we want to make sure that we're not just piling on to students because we can always find more to pile on to students. But this is a chance for them to be exposed, think about it, reflect critically, garden and think about it, go for a bike ride, and then come into class and then you talk about it. So the class time is only for that next piece of the learning. And uh, I, I have made many video lectures of my own, which are maybe my PowerPoint slides and no students asking questions. So what might be a, a 50 minute lecture then becomes a 20 minute recorded lecture which they can review online. So it's shorter, quicker. They can go back over it a few times and then they come to class. So that's how I would use flip lec flipped classrooms or flipped lectures. I do it mostly for my grad students, but um, but I have bits and pieces in my undergrad, but all of my, my classes are online at the graduate level. So I have many, many different videos, different glasses, different haircuts, different clothes over the years that I have used I have a bit of a library of, of different ones for the flipped classroom. So there's an example. Uh, group discussions. So we talked a bit about think, pairing, sharing, uh, blogging, online journaling, essentially, where you have students share their ideas and then you have the opportunity to have other people read them. Uh, as Gersher knows, I keep a journal. So when we're driving around India, I'm just busy writing. After we do something, I'm reflecting on it. And that helps me think about it. It helps me remember. When you do it online, then you can also share it with other people. So if I pass my journal around, you can see what I've been doing all weekend. Might not be as easy as if I actually had it on a, a blog or another online website. The only issue around putting material online is you want to make sure that that students are sharing what's important in a safe environment. So you don't want them to reveal personal information. If you have a, and I don't know if you use learning management systems here, like Canvas or anything like that. If you have those types of systems we do in North America, then you need a password to get to them. And only people in a class would be able to read what other people post. So it's very safe in that regard and it and allows people to get together and then make comments. So rather than have the whole world be able to comment, just the students in the class. And, and oftentimes by reading what someone else has done in your class, it helps you understand even deeper as a <laughs> student. So the same idea when you talked about being in your hostel and you were able to go to your uh, senior, right? Same idea, that discussion or that sharing. Benefits of small group learning. So we can do many of the strategies that I, sh that I talked about, PBL, uh, dis online discussions, uh, case studies, often happen in smaller groups. So people can work together. Uh, you share those, those learning opportunities. So you're not just doing it by yourself. It's not taking something home and reading on your own. It's, it's better to socialize that learning. Uh, the other thing is the authentic nature of, of what's happening. If we have a wicked problem in that group, we are going, wait a minute, this would be like if you had a vet practice and I had a vet practice and we we're coming together to try to solve a problem or go through a case or I have an animal and I don't know what to do with it. I'm not sure how it's presenting. Can we work together? Those kinds of authentic opportunities are, are just invaluable. And that's what small group learning will do. Uh, the complex high order thinking then you get back to Bloom's taxonomy. We want to get to that evaluation and synthesis, the top of that pyramid. I'm going to, I'm going to find a Bloom's and bring it. Because you're going to think that this is what Bloom's taxonomy is, is Jay making a bad triangle with his hands, but that's not. Bring Bloom's. Not flowers when I say Bloom's, hmm. although you're thinking about getting flowers, right? Um, and, and the idea of if you plan small group work, it's a better use of people's time. Even though when we lecture, we give a consistent message to a group of people. When we do small group work, then they can get through the stuff that they're familiar with or comfortable with and then focus on the, on the difficult parts. 
Um, but sometimes group strategies don't work. Hmm. So all of those strategies I shared with you are common and have been useful, but sometimes they don't necessarily get us to where we're going to go. Uh, I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm going to skip this group discussion. Thank you. Because I'm hoping we can be done by one o'clock. Um, but, but often what happens is our students miss something, something goes wrong, and then our group discussions don't work out the way they should. And these are some of the things that happen. And we've all seen this before. We're in a group and one person takes charge. So no one gets the opportunity to learn or be an um, equal member of what's going on. Or we have the exact opposite where nobody takes charge and nobody wants to talk. And so all of that time that you thought would be useful, you might as well have spent on a lecture because at least you're going through the content. If your group isn't engaged, then they're just like, ah, we'll just wait and then let the other groups talk. You know how that works as well? If, we, if we, we just stay quiet, then the, the groups who are more active will lead the conversation. And then when the professor comes to us, we'll just say, oh, yeah, well, we had exactly what they did. And then they didn't have to do any work. We know that happens. That's not ideal. Uh, off topic will always happen. We see, that, we see that in this group, right, all the time. Hmm. A little drifting is important because it allows that exploration of other materials and it, it allows um, people to start to build those interpersonal communication skills and, and group skills. But to completely get off topic is an issue, especially with a case study where everything is there and they pretty much know where they have to do. Uh, give them clear expectations if you find that they're, they're getting off topic. Or say you have five minutes, then somebody in the group will be like, we got to get this done because we only have <laughs> pretty soon it's five, four, three, two, one. If you haven't gotten anything done. Um, if you build the cases, if you choose really good cases or really good direction for jigsaws and problem-based learning, then there will be excitement. But if you choose boring material, present it in a boring way, bless you, it will be boring. Uh, side conversations, interpersonal conflict. Whenever I set up groups, I always do a lap if it's in a room and I make sure that everybody's doing okay. Like right off the bat, here's your group. I will assign people groups. Uh, where I'll ask them to get in their own groups, but I'll always go around right off the bat. Do you know what you're doing? Yes. Okay. Is there any issue I have to deal with? No. Good. And then I move on to the next group. And then I go back around and I just monitor what's going on. Because if you don't, then you may have people say, no, 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 this is where we have to go. No, no, no. This. And they spend the whole time arguing and not making any progress. Um, this is the opposite. So some people want to dominate the group because they want to be in charge. They want to be the the uh, Maharaja, Super. right? Yes. Um, but uh, sometimes people get stuck doing it because nobody wants to work. Who will take notes? Fine, I'll take notes because I always take notes. Who wants to be the presenter? Fine, I'll be the presenter because I'm always like those kinds of things. That's not helpful for anyone. People get really good at presenting and taking notes, but the other people in the group aren't participating. Uh, this is another thing is that people worry about how they're you know, they don't want to be foolish. They don't want to make mistakes. And a lot of these group projects, they're so ill-defined that they're, they scare people. So you have to reassure them that they're not going to fail the class if they go off in the wrong direction because they've misinterpreted something. That's how we learn. But, but small group work is often seen as we start with lecture and then we move into practical or we move into, but this is another common one that we do and be aware that, that there's some things that can go wrong. These are things you have to think about. So to avoid all of these, does it make sense to use group work? If not, then don't do it. If you don't think your students can handle it, if you want to introduce them to the concepts first and then make it a more permanent strategy, then that's fine. Uh, what do you really want them to learn? Sometimes you give them uh, a problem-based learning just so that they can get used to working together. It has nothing to do with the problem. So that's part of the hidden curriculum. Mm -hmm. You're not tricking them. You're giving them a chance to see some new content. But really, the idea is that in the future, you want the groups to be solid and productive. So don't put a whole lot of emphasis on the very first time they do it. You mean working as a team? Yeah. Yeah, just building the Alone skills. and as a team, both. Yep. 
Um, make sure that you have steps if you need them to go through steps. So start off by doing a literature scan. Then pull that important information from the literature scan. Know that in the end, you're doing a presentation to the rest of the group so that they understand where they need to move, move their time along and where they need to maybe delegate duties to different people within the group. And then what is your assessment and evaluation? We've, we've talked about that quite a bit. Let them know. Let them know how you are going to help them learn and ultimately if there is a grade or a mark assigned to it, what they have to do to be able to be successful. So 40, 40, 10, 10. 50, 50. Yes. Okay. Uh, Instructor-led discussions. Most of the time, we as faculty or professors are leading the instruction. It's what we get paid to do. If not, everything would be self-directed learning. So a lot of that is your job, regardless of how you incorporate strategies and what you do. Often the best way to start is to start with a question. Begin with something. It gets people thinking, it gets them nervous because they know they may have to answer it. But again, this is John Dewey, one of the core foundational people in terms of learning and structured learning. But it's the way we get started. And you as a teacher, ask lots of questions. Your students should ask lots of questions as well. And that's how we know we have a healthy functioning teaching and learning environment. But we have to work hard with those questions. So we may have really good questions, but how do we make sense? How is it not just a discussion that goes on? And these are some of the things that I've done and that others maybe you have as well. Making a visible display. So when you ask students a question and they begin to respond, oftentimes someone will have a PowerPoint slide on the screen and you'll start to type those things up. So you're actually creating notes based on responses. Uh, I have, I use a, a person that I refer to as a Google jockey and I will assign someone, especially in a large class, I have some large classes like 200 undergrad students and I can't keep track of all of the discussion that's going on and get it down. So I will assign someone to be on a Google Doc and their job is to, to keep a running record of what goes on. So that's why I call them a Google Jockey. And that document is then shared with everyone else. So what we're doing is we're making a, a, a record of the student ideas so that while I'm facilitating and asking questions, I'm not like, oh, wait a minute, let me write that down. Oh, wait, that's a good idea really disrupts the flow, especially in a big classroom. And as you know, when you have a big class, it doesn't take much to get off track. And once you lose a big class, it's like driving a ship. If you're off course, like the Titanic, you hit the iceberg. You don't just do a quick turn and get away. So you want to make sure that you're keeping that discussion in the large groups on track. And, and that's really helpful. Um, the other thing is that when you have that person typing up the Google Doc, you can say, look what so-and-so said, and look what you said, and you can see how we're starting to make those strong connections. So you, people's thinking then gets tied to the thinking of other <laughs> folks in the room, and that makes them realize, okay, we're part of a community here. We're starting to understand the concepts together. Uh, this is another one, is that when students have a question of you, then you paraphrase it, reframe it, and make it a statement, and then it becomes an issue for discussion. So they may say, you know, I don't understand where to, why we're doing this. And then you might say, we do this because, turn it into a statement, and then people have that opportunity to continue. Because sometimes the questions can just be a dead end. Uh, the other thing is uh, student opinions. We, all have, we always have lots of people who are willing to share their opinions, uh, but we also have students who are not. And it allows those students to see themselves in the content that, that comes out of the discussion as opposed to just being on the periphery and, and watching what's, what's going on. So that, those are some of the things that I've done. Um, this, is, this is one where students will often ask you, well, what do you think? You're the professor. And I always throw it right back at them and say, I don't know, maybe it's this. What do you think? Like, don't do that. I'm like, no, I do that. I still have grad students today who have, who have graduated long ago and they call it the Wilson method. And they said, oh, I used the Wilson method the other day where I, 
student asked me a question I didn't answer. I just threw it back at them and they were so frustrated. And they said, yeah, just like you used to do to us. Uh, that That is, you know, it continues things. It's frustrating for them because they want you to give them the answer and then be done. But to have a good conversation, you want to continue to unpack and explore what's happening. And, and uh, I love doing that. Um, if someone provides you with an answer or provides an answer, but there's not clarity, then you ask other students in the room. Do you understand this? Does this make sense? Do you have a way of supporting this? Or if someone gets particularly confused, it's always good to hear from the students in the group. And again, I keep turning things back to it. Um, yeah, if someone says something that doesn't make sense and all of a sudden no one knows what, what we're doing, uh, or someone gives you a wrong answer, I always say, like you did today, I was looking for something else. I want to draw out, I want to continue to drill down. So I make that, I make a commitment to someone who gives me an answer, but it's not right to solve it together. Let's solve this together. So we're not quite there yet, but let's talk about how we might get there collectively, as opposed to saying, you're wrong, try again. That person will never raise their hand or get involved because you've completely embarrassed them and you've shut them down. And there is value in participation, even when the answer is wrong. It's, and it, people say, okay, I'm going to give it a shot and maybe I get the wrong answer, but Jay is not going to ridicule me or call me out in front of my classmates. There's an opportunity to recover and, and to go through that. Um, this is another thing is, uh, you know, crispy, the bullet, right? Those are things that, that come up and in conversation, they mean things to us now when we talk about them. We give credit to the people who have come up with them. So we have Dr. Bullet and Dr. Crispy, for example. Uh, if a student sees something that's particularly creative, and they will often bring things that you've never thought of before, you want to give them credit for what they're doing. You want to say, okay, this is the one that... that uh, um, Dr. Sani, this is a Saniism, for example. Uh, and a Saniism would be looking at something 10 steps ahead because he's so clever, right? And he's always thinking about 14 things uh, in advance of I'm. And so people would be, oh, that's a Saniism. I know what's going on, right? No, one of my students, Amit Sharma, he, I learned something from him. He told me there's a role of artificial intelligence in anyone who's I never could have imagined oh. it. So, it helps. There you go. Actually. Absolutely. So we have those discussions. Artificial intelligence in animal spent. Yes. Robotics. Yes. Robotics. It's being done. Robotics. So let's let's quickly go through lecturing, and then I'll turn you loose for lunch. Mm -hmm. I love to lecture. Uh, I lecture party. Talk to people because I like to talk. I get. I tell people I get paid to talk. <laughs> That's what I do. Uh, but I know that for some people, lecturing is difficult. And for some people, uh, they're never really sure, certain in their own mind if they've got it. Because it is a sometimes a very impersonal way of delivering content. And you're not always truly engaged with your students. And what you're generally most focused on is, is getting material out. So we'll talk, talk about some strategy that can be helpful. These are pictures of uh, USAS. Some of you may have seen these covered in snow before. Uh, the chemistry building is the one in the middle, the one that looks kind of like a castle. Uh, the College of Agriculture is the one on the left, I think. Oh no, maybe that's the, that's on the behind picture. Is that, yeah, it's in behind, it's the glass. The glass one. There. Glass one in behind. Uh, on the right is the Memorial Gates. It used to be the entrance to the university, but cars are bigger and the roadways uh, take more traffic. So they moved the road and lots of people get their pictures there. I've had my wedding, I have my wedding pictures taken in front of that. It's a beautiful stone wall. And there's always lots of nice flowers and things around. The campus is, is very green and very lush, uh, except this time of year where it's covered in ice and snow. Uh, but it is a it is a very beautiful campus, and and uh, I hope all of you get an opportunity to visit there someday. And then I can take you around and and uh, show you um, many strategies we can use for teaching. Uh, but one of the most common is lecturing, and this so the definition lecture noun uh, a period of time in which a professor attempts to transfer the content of his or her notebook to the student's notebook 
without passing through the brain of either. <laughs> so it's kind of a cheeky um, description of what it is. I, lecture is also a verb. It's the it's the action of speaking to a group. Uh, so that that's one thing that we do. And and even though this kind of shines lecturing in a bad light, it can be done. There's a reason why we've done it for thousands of years, uh, and, and if, if done correctly, it can be an effective way of of working with students. Uh, but we this is this is a question for all faculty. Should lectures be our foundation? I don't know if there's a right or a wrong answer. I think it has a I think it has a place. I think it is how we are remembering our content. Go ahead, Prashish. Talk I think yes. Yeah, they should be. They must be rather. Yeah. <clears throat> and I believe lecture should be that style Thank that you. students can learn majority of the things without even during the lecture itself. Mm -hmm. It should be long enough. It yeah. should not be 45 or 50 minutes. It should be, as you said, maybe one and a half hour mm -hmm. so that there's no need of them repeating uh, at their life. They can learn majority of the things in, in an interesting manner in the class itself. And then, of course, practically, that's equally important. Yeah. More important, rather, practically or clinically. So we're all in agreement, though. Like everyone's happy about lecturing. Is there anyone here would rather not ever lecture? No? Okay, good. That's good to know. Um, the art of a good lecture. So depending on what you do and how you do it, these are some of the things that are common elements of a successful lecture. The notion of using your voice, being enthusiastic if possible, but not being penalized for... If you're not a game show host in front of your students, because some people are, and they run around. If you come to my lectures, and depending on the room I'm in, if I have a large lecture hall with stairs, and stuff, I'll be like running up and down. I'll have a microphone on so people can hear me. And so the people, they sit at the back of the room and think that they'll never, I'll come and sit beside them and cause all kinds of grief. But that's my style. I think everybody can be a successful lecturer with their own personal style and how they would do it. One of the important parts of a lecture, in, in addition to using your voice, so speaking clearly and so that everybody can hear, is the idea that you need a bit of a break. Oftentimes, we just start, push play, and talk for 50 minutes, and then we're done. We don't ask questions. We don't allow people to stand up. We don't do think, pair, share. All of those kinds of strategies can help just break up the monotony. And there's lots of research that says... 10 minutes of, of a chunk of information is a lot. So it's good to change course. It's good to have people move around. It's good to have them do a bio break or what have you. Um, Which break? A bio break, go to the bathroom. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, the idea of learning how to use the room. So depending on the room that you're in and then learning how to use technology uh, can be helpful and, and a projector, uh, some examples on the slide, a good chalkboard, chalk and and uh, chalkboard is still a technology, or a whiteboard with markers. Uh, all of those things can help you and, and help you be successful in, in delivering a good lecture. <clears throat> this is the issue, though, for a lot of people, is that they don't consider anything else. And that's what I've tried to have you think about today is rather than just focus on lecturing, and that's the only way you can ever deliver content ever, and I know that you all believe that that is not the case, but some people feel that uh, that's the only way to get information. We don't trust students to read. We don't trust them to do group work. We don't trust them to be critical. We just have to deliver a lecture. And I think that that's unfair to students. And it certainly uh, robs you of the ability to use your creativity to deliver content. Uh, when you're developing a uh, teach, I'm trying to think where this fits in. Okay, I'm going to skip that. Okay, so when we're talking about different learning and different lectures, these are the type of changes we can possibly incorporate. So is it just about you transmitting or is it the opportunity? And for some reason, I spelled learner wrong twice on that slide. I have leaner censored, centered, and then on that bottom blue line, I have learner without the A. Oh my gosh. Those are the things that I noticed. So if I was the external on this, I would be upset with the uh, grammar and writing right now. Um, when we are teaching, the more learner-centered we are, the more opportunities students have to be dealing with the content and understanding what's going on. So this is something that you want to keep in mind. We can lecture, but our 
lecture still has to be more than simply about you standing at the front of the room and transmitting information. How do you give the students a chance to answer questions? How do you give students a chance to think about problems? Do you lecture a little bit, take a break, have them work in a group and then come back? Do you lecture once during the year and or during the year, during the week, and then the rest of it is all practical? Sometimes that's the best way to do it. So thinking about how you are being the focus or the students are being the focus. And the more we can get the students focused, the more they begin to make sense of the information. The transmission is the delivery of just basic information. And oftentimes that's all we need to do. Uh, content. The more you talk about content, the more people are like, oh, I could just be reading this online right now, or I could be reading a textbook. How do we take that content and make it active? How do we take that content and then have students begin to process it and use it? A, a concern about our lectures is that we're just delivering material that can be read. We need to have those discussions. We need to have engagement. We need to talk about, now that you know what this is, how does it work? Same thing when it comes to surface and deep learning. Often, if we have so much content, we don't get to go deep enough on it. We may have a lecture, and all we're trying to do is get through our slides. If possible, focus on that key ball of knowledge and have students go as deep in it as possible. So if you're lecturing, give them time to think about it, but don't bring in other information that may not be on the final exam. Or if it is on the final exam, it means nothing related to the course and learning outcomes. Give them a chance to really make their way through that core information. And then they may not be 110% as far as their knowledge base goes, but they will be a really good solid 95%. And that's going to make them a good vet. And then they're going to come back and they're going to work with you to increase and improve upon their knowledge because they have that deep learning of a narrower group of content content uh, information. If you are looking at your course, are you structuring it so that you have these connections being made? And we talked about objectives and content. Where are they? Are you too focused on the outcomes and not thinking about the content properly? Are you too focused on assessment, but you're not really teaching and providing them with teaching and learning strategies? Again, that will find its way into the way you deliver your lectures. You, but you have to kind of step back and go, okay, I'm going to apply this kind of teaching strategy on this day because it is re re reinforcing my learning outcomes, my learning objectives. Uh, these days, it's just going to be content. It's going to be simply, we have to get through this information and I need students to be able to understand it. And how is that balance happening? Are you too far to one side on either one of those? Uh, you can see there when students have a balanced approach or when you have a balanced approach, they're going to be much more successful. Uh, in terms of lecturing, no single technique will suit every learning situation okay, or teaching strategies or it won't suit who you are. The key in the end, though, is that do we have alignment with our outcomes and assessments? Yes. Then that teaching strategy, we can be confident that we will grow into it and that our students will be successful. Thanks. All right. Enjoy your lunch. We'll be back here. 2.30? 2.30? We have some work with my students. Maybe 3 o'clock. Okay. okay. I'll be here at 2.30. The rest of us will